millennials, you know, they want it, you know, you have to think their way or they just don't like you and you're the devil and they hate you and everything else. So, you know, especially when you're doing Christianity and Christianity, there's a lot of Christians that, uh, and famous Christians that have given Christianity a bad rap. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, that's facts. It, it, they do. And so it, it's really hard for me to be able to do YouTube full time. Like I haven't even got to the point where I can get monetized yet. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. But then again, like I said, I haven't, I really don't put out like a crud load of videos. Yeah. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time. But yeah, I'm trying to build an organization to do exactly that. Have both Christians and atheists be able to do debates full time. So hopefully we'll be able to start that up pretty soon. Um, is there an, like right now your video is pretty grainy. Do you have a higher resolution or is it maybe just in the settings? Uh, now it's shooting on 4k on my side. It should be. Yeah. It might be in the settings of this website. Uh, if you go to video, like the gear in the top right video, let's see it. Hold on. HD, yeah, HD video, prefer HD video. <laughs> Maybe that's mine. Yeah. Settings. Video. HD video. Is that any better? A little bit, I think. I was yep, yep. on the HD video. Now it's yeah, it's definitely better now, for sure, hundred percent. Okay, good. I had to process a bit, but now it's better. Uh I sure wish these headphones would go louder. I'm kind of deaf. The military made me deaf, and then, <laughs> of course, working in the oil field don't, doesn't help. Yeah. Well, now you're frozen. Um, that's weird. Is it still freezing? Yeah, like your picture's frozen. I can still hear you fine, though. Huh. Let me, let me try to refresh on my end. All right, now now you now I can see you. Is that better? Yes. All I can right. Dance if you want me to. I'm not a good yes, dancer. Yes, yes, we dance. must. We must now have dancing. What what kind of dancing? Uh, all right, everything looks good on my end. I'm live. People in the audience say they can hear us fine. We are good to go. So. Richard, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, my name is Richard Long. I've uh, been a Christian um, for quite some time now. Christian apologist, probably going on about five years. Um, I got a degree in theology from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, I have uh, certificates from Bible University in apologetics. Um, and I just do a lot of research, a lot of studying, and honestly, I'm just in pursuit of the truth on whatever that might be. And for me, I believe it to be God, uh, a Christian God specifically, but we'll talk about that later. And, uh, I just wrote a book and hopefully it should be coming out soon. So hopefully everybody can look for it. It's called stand for God. Um, will the defendant please ride evidence for God's existence and, that's really it about me. I have a podcast uh, named The Christian Apologist. I have a YouTube channel named The Christian Apologist. And you can usually catch either one or both at the same time. And I'm pretty much everywhere on any major podcasting network. Awesome. Uh, I am an atheist. I run an atheist YouTube channel where all of my viewers are right now. Um, and by atheist, I mean I believe that everything is better explained by naturalism. I think that all the arguments and evidence... Um, more point to a naturalistic conclusion. So could you tell me some of the evidence and reasons you believe that do indicate a God? Um, the three biggest things I can give is like the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, and the moral argument. And I'm sure y'all have heard most of those already. And so it's basically just going to be like beating a dead horse. But those are the three reasons I do believe in a God. And, and of course, the biggest one for me is the cosmological argument or the contingency argument however you want to refer to it as. Cool. So the cosmological argument states that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause. But why think that cause is a God and not just an, another natural law of physics or something we just haven't discovered yet? It could be. But we, we don't know that yet. And for what we do know from the science that we do have is that nature wasn't here for this to begin. 
So for it to be naturalism, to me, that means that something would have to have been here. But yet, most philosophers and, and cosmologists sit there and say that there was literally nothing before the Big Bang. There was no thing. And so for something to come out of nothing, to me, that means that something has to exist outside of the time, the space, the material, for it to create something in to time, space, and material. Uh, you say that most philosophers and physicists say there was nothing. As far as I know, like none of them say that. Like the, I think the consensus is is that there was always a something that preceded that. Um, like Lawrence Krauss wrote his book Something from Nothing, which was a misrepresentation. Like even when he's been asked about it, it was never a literal philosophical nothing. Every physicist. I think in every physicist model says there was a natural thing before the Big Bang. I don't think there's any evidence that shows nature began to exist. It's only certain parts of nature that began to exist at the Big Bang. Right. And even Stephen Hawking says that, you know, I mean, he said that nothing was here before. But then, of course, he goes on to say that, you know, he believed there was a quantum vacuum. Yep. But to me, if you're going to sit there and say there's a quantum vacuum, then you can't say there's nothing. Because if there's nothing, then that's literally no thing. And so to sit there and say there's a quantum vacuum that created all of this, well, first off, you got to have proof of that quantum vacuum, of course. And if you don't have proof, but that's your theory, then you can't claim that there was nothing. You have to say that there was something. All right. I, totally, so, I totally agree. I think so, that uh, in physics, the way they use nothing is very different. Because uh, in, in academic fields, the way they use language is oftentimes different from the way they used in colloquially in everyday language. So like atom, the, the literal Latin meaning of the word atom is the smallest constituent part, but atoms in physics are actually a combination of protons and electrons and neutrons and things. And so right. in physics, nothing means none of the stuff that we can empirically know about today, but it doesn't mean a literal philosophical nothing. It just means none of the known kinds of stuff. Um, and so I totally agree. I think it's a weird use of language that doesn't really map onto what most people understand by nothing. But when they do say nothing like Stephen Hawking and Lawrence Krauss, what they mean is just none of the empirically verified stuff. That's it. And right. so the Big Bang, all it, all it does is show that there was something else we don't know about before the Big Bang, but none of it says that all of nature began to exist. It's just our known stuff began to exist. And so I don't think it's reasonable to conclude that because of the evidence of the Big Bang, that something non-natural must exist. It could just be, I think all of the evidence indicates it could, is most likely just a natural thing. Right. But if something, and to me though, is if something begins to exist, then something has to start that beginning. It's not going to just begin on its own. It's not going to just start on its own. Something has to begin it. Even if you're right, even if we do discover later on in the future that there was something, a quantum vacuum, there was something out there, something had to have started all of it to begin. And it's like, you know, and I'm sure you've heard this uh, many times and believe many different ways, but it's the same thing as if saying, you know, you find a, a laptop or a cell phone sitting on a beach and nobody's around. We don't assume that, you know, nothing put that there. We assume that somebody put that there. And so, and it, to me, it's like something as big as the universe and as grand as the universe and as fine tuned as the universe is, something had to have started it. Oh yeah, for sure. So I think that my explanation is that there is a necessary natural thing that doesn't have a mind. Like I think it was probably a quantum field of some kind and interactions in that quantum field produced the universe. And that seems to me to be a better explanation than a God. Why do, would you prefer a God than to like quantum fields? Because I believe it had to be an intelligent mind to be able to make everything into a fine tuning as the earth is. For instance, like, I mean, you can go into like all the details of, you know, like all the, all the stars in our universe are equal to all the sands of the grains of the earth times a hundred thousand. And without those stars being there, the gravitational forces wouldn't be right for us to exist. And the tilt of the earth, if it wasn't exactly the way it was, we never would have existed. Or if Jupiter wasn't where it was, you know, we probably would already have been destroyed by now because it's a quantum vacuum for us, you know. I mean, not a quantum vacuum, but a, a maze, space vacuum, basically, you know, for all the debris that's getting flown around at us. Asteroids, yeah. And, and so, you know, and I just think with those kinds of fine-tuning, I just don't 
see how it could possibly be an accident. I don't see how it could just be nature just did that. To me, nature can say what is, but it can't say what ought to have been. It, it can't tell us that, but a mind can. And so for this to have happened the way it is and to know that, you know, through the second law of thermodynamics, that the, that the universe is running out of entropy, it's going to run out of energy, and we're all going to go into heat death someday, then that means that it had to have started, and there's going to be an end at some point. So I just think that it was all put together, not by an accident. I just don't see how accidents can create that. Uh, so you mentioned a lot of the constants of like the Earth, the tilt and the Jupiter and things like that. But that seems to be explained by the fact that there are trillions of different solar systems. And so necessarily, a lot of them are going to have the correct conditions for life. And NASA's found 5,000 within our nearby galaxies. So that seems to be not finely tuned. That seems to be random chance. Um, would you disagree on that one? I don't think it's random chance. I do think, and a, a lot of people, and this is, might be where you're going with what you're saying. It might not be, but a lot of people say, well, why would God put us here and not on another, you know, another galaxy and on one of these other planets and everything else. And to me, it's, I think the vastness of the universe and the different galaxies is just to show the uh, power and, and the, and the largeness, if you will, of God, because, you know, if the universe was to stop at our clouds, we wouldn't think like God was that big. It's like, wow, okay, that's great, bud, you know? But then when you see the massive of the universe and all these other galaxies, I think it just shows his, his massiveness, his awesomeness. Well, I'm trying to like make the connection between the fine tuning leads to a God. So like if we see uh, a bunch of dice and, uh, say we have a bunch of 100 sided dice and 1% of them landed ones. I mean, we wouldn't call that fine tuning. It's just chance because there's a random based on the way the dice works. There's a random chance that 1% of them are going to land ones. And so if we look at the universe and we say the tilt of the earth is this much Jupiter is there and the gravitational balancing is all like this we can at the solar system level we can say well oh that's just like a dice landing one there's a whole bunch of solar systems like that and most of them don't because most of them aren't ones they're mostly other numbers because there's more other numbers right. but there is a certain percent of them that are ones and it's exactly what we would expect by chance so just related to the earth's constants it seems like that's not finely tuned that's just chance stuff um, why would you conclude that the Earth's constants are finely tuned as opposed to like the universe constants themselves? That would be a different argument. But just the relationship of the Earth in the solar system seems to be fully explained by chance because there's lots of different solar systems. To me, OK, so the easiest way for me to think of this is and using your dice analogy. You're saying, you know, like if you had a dice that had 100 different heads and if I was to say I'm going to throw out a five and it landed on a five, that's a pretty good chance. I'll play, probably play the lottery, but that's a pretty good chance if it actually landed on that five. But to me, it's, it's like taking like five or six dices and rolling all fives a certain amount of times in a row. That's no longer chance. It's either I'm cheating or something else is involved. And so, and the reason I say like five dice is because there's all different types of fine tuning arguments that we could go into with, you know, the way the, the way the world is so that we could exist here today. And so if you just took five of those and yet rolled them and kept rolling them and rolling them, I don't know how many times you're going to have to roll those to actually get them to all land on five at the exact same time. So... That's right, why right. I say. So, but if imagine if you had billions and billions of dice and they're all being rolled at the same time, right. a whole bunch of them are going to land five, 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 right? That's going to happen pretty often. It's going to be right. rare, but if you have billions and billions of them occurring, it's not finely tuned when it lands five, 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 five. It's just one of the many random chance incidents, right? Right. But as far as we know, as of right now, Earth is the only place in all the galaxies they have human beings, they have sentient beings. And so it's not like all these other galaxies 
that have an earth type atmosphere or type planets and that are in perfect condition and everything else actually have life on it because they can't support life as far as we know right now. All I can do is go off of what science says right now. Now, of course, there's theories that, you know, there could be life out there. They're looking for bacteria. They're looking for all kinds of things everywhere else. But nothing has supported life. They have no proof of any of this yet. Well, they do have proof that there are millions of planets that have the exact same conditions that we do that would support life. We just obviously we can't go there yet. We, obviously, that's not we don't have the technology to. But when you're talking about the fine tuning, that's the constants of our solar system that would allow for life. And we can prove scientifically that there are tons of those. NASA has an entire repository of just listing them because they've been searching for them for a lot. So if you're going to call that fine tuning, it seems more like, oh, look, there's billions of dice and this one land 5555. Five, five, and oh, look, there's that one landed 5555. Five, 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 and that one landed 5555. Five, five, five. And so it seems like that's all explained by chance. Um, I don't know why you would conclude fine tuning there because there are tons of planets that have the exact same conditions that ours do. Um, just because we only see sentient life on our planet isn't doesn't mean there isn't sentient life out there. It just means we can't go there. Um, so it, it seems strange to me if you're saying that the constants are fine tuned, yet we see the constants in lots of different places. Oh. Did you refresh? Yes, I got knocked off there. It's really, really windy here. So ah. some of our, I don't even know if you can hear the wind, but mm -mm. it's like whistling really loud. Oh, wow. So suppose that we have a cold front coming in. It's supposed to get down to like 60. <laughs> that's that's our cold front. Oh, God. So <laughs> oh, it's just got um, my eight inches of snow. Yeah, so, so as I was saying, it seems like we know for a fact scientifically that there are thousands and thousands of planets very close to us that have the exact same conditions that ours do. So it doesn't seem like you can say the conditions are finely tuned because the conditions are random chance. It seems like, oh, look, these happen all the time, all over the place at a certain percentage chance. So I don't, it doesn't seem like you can call that fine tuning because we know for a fact it happens by random chance. Now, obviously we don't know any other sentient beings are out there because we can't actually go to them and check, but when we're talking about the fine tuning, we're talking about the conditions of the planet, not whether life is actually on it. So if the conditions of the planet can support life and those conditions happen at a certain rate, like five, 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 five on dice, if you throw a million dice, then it doesn't seem like you can call that fine tuning. Well, so I just think the universe itself is can't be a coincidence and it can't be chance um for the simple fact of you know when the big bang first started and i'm sitting here looking at my powerpoints here but the universe was when it was just 10 34th of a second old you know a hundredth of a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second age if it wouldn't have expanded at the rate that it did then we wouldn't exist nothing would exist nothing would be here and then for it to expand out the way it did and to even have other galaxies that have planets like ours. But I'm not going to speak about the other planets and, and the other galaxies because I don't know much about them. I'm not a cosmologist. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know much about them. I know about most a lot of our universe, you know, what, what's in our little area in our galaxy. And so for it to expand the way it did and to land the way it did, and for all the planets to line up the way they have. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, other things, too, like uh, and small things, things that um, I don't know if y'all learned them in school, but we did about how, you know, like an object in motion stays in motion until something changes its direction. And so pretty much a lot of the planets, you know, spin in the same way, except for there's a couple of planets, there's a couple of moons that spin backwards. And to me, it's I understand to me, it's the question of why are they spinning backwards? And of course, my answer is, is because I believe God knew someday we were going to discover those and we would question that. Why are they spinning backwards? You know, I think God put out things there for us to try to figure out so we would know that he exists. So scientists would know that he exists. But I mean, there's a there's just so much about the just the, the expansion of the universe. The when it first started out, the Big Bang, there's so much to do with, like I said, and I know you say the fine tuning and you compare it to other galaxies and, and everything else, but for us here, 
that we know, as far as we know, this is the only place with life, sentient beings, then something to me had to have created that. I just don't, I can't get to a point where there's a chance. Like, I'm not going to sit there and I don't know if you know Frank Turek. You probably saw a lot of his videos. I've met him. I'll, I've liked his analogy about, you know, the writing in the sand, you know, like Jason loves Mary. You know, we, we don't walk across that and think that just by chance it happened to be there. We don't think by chance a crab came out and did it. We know a person did it. We know an intelligent mind had to write that. And it also goes into like DNA and RNA and, and the genetic codes and to just to know that with billions and billions of letters that have to line up exactly perfect for us to exist, I don't think that's a chance. Because, like I said, if you say something just Jason loves Mary, we know a person did it. But yet, if you have a code written out billions of letters long that creates human life, then we say all of a sudden it's, it was chance, it was evolution, it was... And I do believe in evolution, so... We won't get in that. I do believe in evolution. I just believe in micro, not macro. Uh, okay, micro. I'll write that down too. So, as far as I know, the entire consensus of everyone in biology and physics is that the constants of our solar system are not finely tuned. There's nothing about those that are finely tuned that's purely explained by chance. You brought up the universe. That's where the fine tuning question is usually debated. Is like, is the original constants of the universe finely tuned? That's a valid question. Um, but when it comes to the questions of our solar system and the tilt of the earth and Jupiter and that, those kind of things, those have been proven scientifically, definitely not finely tuned. That's absolutely 100%. Everybody in physics agrees chance. Um, same with the DNA and RNA thing, but that's a slightly different topic. So when it comes to the fine tuning of the universe, like the gravitational constant, the strong and weak electromagnetic force constant, those kinds of constants, if you want to say those are finely tuned, because Usually when people say they're finely tuned, it means they could have been different. So like if you mentioned, if the gravitational constant had changed in any little bit, then there would be no planets or galaxies or things. So there's only a very small range that it could be that would allow for planets and life and stuff. Um, but that can be explained by them all being inter intertwined. So like we know that the weak and the electromagnetic force were thought to be two different forces, but at a high enough temperature, they combined to be the same force. It could be the case that all of the different forces are tied together such that if you change one, all the other ones will change proportionally because of some other law of nature that we haven't discovered yet, which ties them all together. If that was the case, then there would be no fine tuning. It would just be like, that's the fundamental law. And there's just, there's just one law there. Um, why would you think that that would be a less plausible explanation of the origin of the constants of nature than a God. Because I believe with everything that there is, I just, I, I can't get over the fact that, that something like that can just happen by chance, not just one chance. It's not like just one thing happened and that was a coincidence. That was a coincidence. That was a random chance, but everything lined up the way it has for us to be here today and you know with just human beings being able to be here and the universe being here and you know like you were talking about the laws to me laws don't create themselves laws are given by lawgivers that's just me i go back to occam's razor i take the least narrow road and, and if that's the most reasonable explanation then that's what i go with I don't sit there and keep looking and digging and digging, trying to say, well, if I keep digging and digging and digging and some years into the future, you know, we might find something else that could explain this and that. That's just me. Like, I, I just follow with Occam's Razor and I sit there and uh, I do research and I study and I see everything else and I just don't see how it can be random. Like, I don't see how the universe can be created and we have all these stars out there 30 trillion miles apart. And that's what's fun. And I mean, it's funny to me. And I agree with uh, some of the other apologists that sit there and say, when scientists sit there and say, oh, we're going to explore space. No, you're not. You're not going to be able to. You can, we can't even barely even touch space. It's so far massive. Like, we'll never even be able to make it to a star. I mean, we can make it to our sun, but obviously you're not going to go there. 
you know, but we'll never be able to sit there and make it to a star 30 trillion miles away. I mean, the fastest we can even travel now is 20,000 miles an hour, approximately, you know, which is about five miles per second. It would take you over 200,000 years to get to a star. You, 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 we're not going to explore nothing. <clears throat> we can see things through telescopes, you know, we can, you know, go through, you know, those kinds of things, but actually exploring, I mean, we can't even explore everything that's in the depth of the ocean yet. And yet they're trying to explore into space and, and everywhere else. So when they started talking about what they know about other uh, galaxies and everything else, I mean, most of it is theories. And, and the reason I say that is because, like Frank Turk says all the time, um, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. So they can have their assumptions, but... They don't know. And I mean, when they do know it, and like I was telling you earlier, like when, you know, if they do find, let's say, um, other planets, like you said, they have found on other galaxies that are pretty much just like earth and fit for life on earth. It doesn't disprove that there's a God to me. It just, just it actually helps to prove that there's a God because what are the odds that you're going to go to another galaxy and find a place just like earth? But yet there ain't no people there. I mean, why hasn't a life been created there? Why hasn't sentient beings been put there? Why, aren't, why hasn't evolution taken effect on other planets if these places do exist? And I'm not saying you're not lying. I'm just, I'm going off of what, you know, science is saying. I don't know. But I just think that with the fine tuning, the, the moral arguments, the, uh, uh, the contingency argument on why is there something rather than nothing? Why isn't there nothing here? Why are we here? Well, so you mentioned Occam's razor. I totally agree in Occam's razor that we should postulate the least entities necessary in order to explain an explanation. But for me, that seems like the quantum field is the least. Quantum field seems to be the simplest explanation because it's the one that we have evidence for. It doesn't seem like to me like we have any evidence of a God. Like um, the difference between... The physics theories and the God theory to me is that all of the physics theories are built on combinations of things that have been proven to not be imaginary. Like string theory, for example, to take one of the ones I don't like, but it, it's one of them, is a combination of two things in physics. One is vacuum energy states, which have been empirically demonstrated in the Casimir effect. And the other is early universe inflation, which was demonstrated in observations of the cosmic microwave background. It's called Guth's early universe inflation. Both of those things we know exist. And so if you combine them, you get string theory. We don't know string theory exists. String theory hasn't been proven, but all of the parts of string theory have been proven. Whereas the parts of a God haven't been like omniscient, omnibenevolent, omnipresent, or whichever parts you want to go with. Those don't have any evidence. Whereas the parts of string theory all do have evidence. So it seems like the string theory hypothesis is a simpler one by Occam's razor than the God hypothesis. I understand. Yeah, I, mean, I see what you're saying. And I mean, I guess it's just, um, it's one of those things where it, everybody's going to come up with their own beliefs. They're going to come up with their own theories and they're going to come up with what makes sense to them. And so like in, in no way do I plan on sitting here having a conversation with you today. And by the end of it, you being like, I'm a believer. I'm going with it. I'm a Christian. I, I don't know. You know, I, I like to hear your thoughts. I like to hear your theories. I like to hear what atheists think, because if I'm wrong, I want to know the truth. That's all there's to it. I want to seek the truth, whether it proves me wrong or whether it proves me right. But have you ever heard of uh, the astronomer uh, Jastro? Maybe. How Maybe. do you spell it? Uh, J-A-S-T-R-O-W. Sounds so one familiar. of the things that he said, he was an, he's an atheist, <clears throat> uh, but one of the things he said, and I'm going to read it because I don't want to get him out of quotes here. He says, astronomers now find that they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on the earth. And they have found that all this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover that there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Now, he's not, a, he won't admit that there's God. 
he's not admitting that there's God. He's admitting that there's supernatural forces, which he can't explain, but he won't admit that there's God, but he is an atheist. And I think he's right. I think they, I think a lot of the astronomers and cosmologists and a lot of scientists who are atheists, I don't think they're out there just trying to prove that there is no God. I don't think most of them are out there with this, you know, they're bent on trying to prove any of this. They're just trying to find the truth for themselves as well. And I think a lot of times for me that they end up saying things and discovering things that help prove that the, the possibility of there being a God. Uh, so when he says supernatural, that means outside of the known natural stuff. So that doesn't mean literally. Yes. Right. That, now, yeah. That's what I was saying. But that could it just be a, a different cool. kind of natural stuff. It doesn't mean that there's literally, we've discovered this new ontology of like magic or whatever. It's, it just means that there's the known stuff and then there's the unknown stuff. So right. um, I don't think that really supports that there's a God there. It just shows that there is something outside of what we know, which everyone, yeah, right. every, every physicist grants that for sure. Um, but, yeah. but the question I asked was, is like, you brought up Occam's razor and I totally agree with Occam's razor. I'm a big fan of that. But which is simpler? Which is which would Occam's razor choose? Would it choose something where all of the parts have been demonstrated or something where there's new parts that haven't been demonstrated? Like, for example, if we see a hoof print in the snow or something, we don't know what caused the hoof print in the snow. Is it simpler to say a horse did it because horse, all the parts of the horses we know about? Or is it simpler to say a unicorn did it? because like magical horns and we don't have any evidence of magical horns it's simpler to go with the horse right because if there's something that's made up of parts that we know about that's a better explanation than something which we have no evidence of right right no i see yeah i agree with you what you're saying with your analogy that you're using but i think as far as occam's razor being used as far as the beginning of the universe i think it i think occam's razor is easier to explain saying Something was created out of nothing. So whatever created it had to be spaceless, timeless, and material because space, time, and matter has to come into existence at the same time for anything to come have come into existence. So therefore, whatever it is, I mean, that's what we refer to as God. But, you know, I'm not saying Occam's, Occam himself would have said, you know, this is God. He just would have said there has to be a force out there that wanted to begin this and created this that lives outside these perimeters uh, well, instead of saying, well, let's just keep digging and digging and digging, trying to find something that can create something out of nothing. And when I say nothing, I literally mean no thing. Uh, yeah. So, so the spaceless, timeless, immaterial part, I also agree with, but um, the consensus in physics is that like space and time are emergent from other natural stuff. So I, everyone agrees, yes, yeah, space and time, not the fundamental thing. They, they came about at the Big Bang. But most physicists think that's another natural thing. That's the horse. So the way that ties into my analogy is that we see a hoof print in the snow, and that's the Big Bang. We don't know what caused this. And we think what caused it is probably a combination of the known stuff, like string theory, uh, combinations of physics, of things like virtual particles, that seems to be like a simpler explanation than a god. A god would seem to be more like the unicorn because there isn't any evidence of uh, non-physical minds or omnipotence or omnipresence or omniscience or any of those properties. But there's lots and lots of evidence of like Casimir effects, cosmic microwave background radiation. Like the combination of those things seems to be the horse in this analogy. So it seems like saying that the quantum physics explains the horse print is the one Occam's razor would choose over the god. Right. I see what you're saying. I think, honestly, what, I, what I'm seeing here is that we'll never come to an agreement because your idea of nothing and my idea of nothing are two totally different things. Your idea of nothing is that, you know, there was something. We just don't know what it is. And my idea of nothing is there's literally no thing. Well, you think there was God, right? So you would also agree there wasn't well, ever... Well, I mean, God was there, but I'm talking about as far as the universe goes, there was nothing there before the universe. Just God himself. Well, how are those different? So in my in my view, there would be a thing before the universe, which is a quantum field, and in yours, there was a thing before the universe, which was God. Because the things that you're saying that existed had to be 
of some kind of material. It had to be some kind of material of some kind. Whether you go into the the smallest quantum atoms you can find, it's something that it's a it's a material of some kind. And so, going back to Albert Einstein, for everything to exist, time, space, and matter have to come into existence at the exact same time. So, for that matter to have been here, time would have already started. Space would have already been here. Because how are you going to have material if you don't have space? Or how are you going to have space if you didn't have time to put it in? So because you got to have the three things all together. Well, no, remember, I agreed. It's not, there's timeless, spaceless, immaterial, other natural stuff that exists. So you don't need any of those things. But you're going to have to have material. No. So what, what, so you literally believe that there was no thing that that was here. No, I, there's definitely something there. Like there can be other kinds of things. Like there's time is a kind of thing. It's a field. Space is a field. Material is a kind of interactions in those fields. And there can be other fields. We could give them different names, but those other fields can exist just fine without time, space, or matter. Time, space, and matter is just a single kind of th stuff. There could be other kinds of stuff outside of that. So give me an example of what could exist outside of time, space, and matter. Uh, the amplitudehedron, emergent space time, Giulio Tononi's information theory, uh, the holographic principle. There's lots of different theories out, string theory, strings. Um, there's lots of possibilities. But you still have to have something. Yes. There still, still has to be there's, something there. There's still something, just like God is a something. There is still something. It's just different than time, space, and matter. So time, space, and matter are a single kind of field. It's just like field A. And there could be a field B and a field C and a field D. Time, space, and matter is not literally all natural stuff. That's not what it means. It's just a kind of natural not, stuff. But the things that you're listing off aren't personal agents. Correct. So how can they, how can they say we're going to create i'm not saying they're talking to each other obviously but i'm saying though how are they going to come to uh, a rationality of saying we are going to create a universe we are going to do this yeah they don't they have don't, they're not person yeah they don't have any rationality there's no rationality right. there they're just determined by forces so they have a nature they have a nature within themselves and their nature determines them to do stuff right but to have nature you have to have something there and you're saying yes. that the something that's there is not a personal force. It's not a personal agent. Yes. And you, and I'm just trying to understand where you're at. So, and you believe that these personal agents non -personal. collided, came together, you know, impersonal, sorry. Yes. Impersonal agents came together at some point and the Big Bang started. Yes. And so, I mean, if that makes sense to you, I mean... That's all I can say. I mean, well, that's my question. Like I said, everybody has their own. I mean, to me, that doesn't make sense at all. To me, it has to be, there has to be some kind of personal agent to push things into order. Like, um, I've heard some of the atheists, not atheists, sorry, apologetic say, like, how does an acorn know to grow to be an acorn? To, I mean, to be an oak tree. How does it know? It doesn't. Something has to tell it to go that way. Something has to move it that way. Like we don't plant an acorn and think an apple tree could come out of it. Well, well, because something has to be moving it that way. Well, like it's like asking, how does a rock know to fall down a mountain? Well, it doesn't. There's a force that causes it to do it. It forces it to do it. So there's yeah, but there's not a force that tells an acorn to become an oak tree. There is actually. It's it's physics. Um, like the 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 reason DNA works is by physical connections. It binds in a way. So it's literally forced to by physics it can't it doesn't choose to um but in the case of the the quantum fields are kind of like a rock how did why did the quantum fields create the universe well because they're determined to by their nature like they have a way of being that they are and so they're going to necessarily produce the universe like a rock so is how did fall. those how did those get here they were necessary they've never not existed outside of space and time so technically you believe in a God. You just don't believe in a theistic God. Well, they wouldn't be a God because they don't have a mind. Because you're saying they've always existed. They've always been here. 
Yeah, yeah. So, warriors. so I I agree. There's a necessary thing that's always been there, but it doesn't have a mind. So, in my view, it wouldn't because I think a god has to have a mind of some kind, like a consciousness. Mm -hmm. So these wouldn't be conscious, so they wouldn't qualify as a god, but they would have like the eternal quality and the power to create a universe. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. So, so my question would be: Is like, why would we prefer one with consciousness as opposed to like a quantum field? Because it goes back to what I was saying. Like, I don't see how we can see just a simple sign of Jason loves Mary in the sand and then look at the universe and then look at human beings and sit there and say that that was by chance. Jason loves Mary is not by chance, but the universe coming into existence, the fine tuning of the universe being here, human beings being here, the DNA being here, the morals, the morality being here. That can't, that's by chance, but not Jason Loves Mary. Like, I just don't see that. Like, I can't, my mind just can't comprehend that. Well, like, I agree with, for me. I agree with Jason Loves Mary because that's something that there is no natural force to produce. That's something that we know humans produce. Like, if I saw a, a car or something, I'm like, obviously, there's no like law of car that produces cars. It's humans that produce cars. But in the case of the origin of the universe, that could just be a product of laws like gravity or something. So, I don't, I don't see the analogy between the laws of physics and Jason loves Mary because Jason loves Mary is a thing that we know for a fact does not be, is not produced by natural laws. Whereas the origin of the universe could be produced by natural laws like rocks falling or something. And so it seems like the origin of the universe could be more like rock fell down mountain, which is something we would totally say is natural and not like the Jason loves Mary, which is something we know isn't natural. But the natural laws that you're speaking of their theories that's what they think was out there they don't know like just like for me i can't sit there and say i got 100 percent burden of proof god exists here it is and it's the same thing with you for instance you can't sit there and say there's 100 percent proof scientists have proven 100 percent no questions asked this was out there before the creation of the universe neither one of us can do that so it's just theories. Like you can sit there and say, "What well, my my uh, belief in God is a theory." You could say that, and just, just you know, I could turn around and say the same thing about yours. Well, yours is just theory as well. Oh yeah. So to me, it just for me the easiest burden of proof to follow is that something had to have create that. That's the easiest thing for me. The easiest way for me to understand that is that human like and, and we'll go to human beings real quick there to me there's no there's no proof of macro evolution there's no proof that you know you can go now i do believe in micro i do believe like i could leave a chihuahua here and if he could live for two billion years by the time i come back i would have a wolf i'd have a german shepherd i'd have all kinds of different dogs but it would still be a dog I don't believe that dog would be flying around and grow wings or grow gills and be in the water. I believe that, you know, it's going to stay within its kind. And so for human beings to be here and for the DNA sequence to be billions of letters long, and if one letter's off, you know, like it's, it's over, it's done. And so I don't see how the Jason loves Mary can have be done by a human being. And we say, we know that's a human being. But yet we take a billion letter sequence like in thousands of encyclopedias and sit there and say, oh, well, this was all put together by chance, by just random acts of chance. And then, of course, you got to get into, you know, the epigenetic information and Darwin's black box and, you know, yada, yada, yada. We don't have to travel down all that. But I just I can't come to graphs that that is by chance. Because chance doesn't cause anything. Chances, chance don't cause anything. Acts and forces cause things, but chance can't cause anything. If, if, you see what I'm saying? Uh, like when we say of. this happens by chance. Well, it didn't happen by chance. I mean, I know that's the word we use when we throw around, but chance actually doesn't cause anything. Well, sort of. So like in physics, there's a pole of 
physicist, uh, Fundamental Attitudes in Physics, which states that randomness and chance are actually themselves forces. But that's a yeah a different topic. Um, yeah, so if you want to say that biology would be evidence why we should prefer a mind, that's that's fine. I'm I'm happy to talk about that later. But just going with just the physics, if we're just looking at the physics, it seems like all of that can be better explained by quantum field. Quantum field is like the horse. It's a combination of things we know about, which can explain all the data. And so that's a simpler explanation than God. Um, just going with the physics. There doesn't seem to be anything in physics that indicates a mind. And if you want to say the biology could indicate a mind, that's fine too. And we can talk about that later. But it seems like if we're just looking at the physics, there isn't anything that indicates a mind. It's just this can all be explained by a quantum field um, as a simpler explanation than a god. Hold on, I was trying to pull this up real quick. Sure. So, I'm starting to try to understand, I guess, what you're, you're talking about. And so, I have here, you know, from astrophysicist Alex uh, Filipinko, I'll probably destroy that. Filipinko, he's from the University of Berkeley. Um, he claims that with the laws of physics, you can get universes. That's what he claims. He says that in the very weird world of quantum mechanics, which describes action on a subatomic scale, random fluctuations can produce matter and energy out of nothingness. But he does go on to say that to get that started, and, and he's an atheist, but to get that started will require a divine spark. Now, when I say divine, like me and you were talking about earlier, I'm not, I don't believe he means God. He's an atheist, but he's just saying something had to have started this something. And so, like I said, I still believe that there was literally no thing out there and you're obviously, you know, you're nothing is there was something, there was a something, nothing out there, if you will. And so, I mean, even if there was a something, something had to start it. Even if there were these, you know, subatomic scale of quantum at, uh, atoms out there, something had to get them started. Something had to combine them. Something had to, you know, create this universe. Right. But the thing that could have created them could be an eternal quantum field, which was never started. So, so like that's, pretty much all of the physicists, like every physicist agrees that, yeah, there's this eternal field of quantum somethingness that caused everything. And it was not started. Nothing started it. It's all, it's eternal. And they have, they have proven that there is this quantum no. something. No, all of has... the parts have been proven. So the parts of the theory, like the things that are in the theory, like vacuum energy states, early universe inflation, those have been demonstrated, but the combination has not been. So the difference here between, like God has never been proven either. So neither God right, or string right. theory have been proven, but the difference is that all of the parts of the string theory have been proven, um, whereas the parts of the God haven't been. So the string theory one is better, even though string theory, you're right, string theory is not proven, um, but all of the parts are. The vacuum energy in the Casimir effect has been proven. Uh, early universe inflation, cosmic background proven. So all of the parts of the theory have been proven, even though the combination hasn't. So it seems to me because the parts have been proven, it's a better theory than a theory that the parts haven't been proven like a god. So do you see why in physics that would be preferred? Like the parts at least are shown to exist. Therefore, this is a better theory than one the parts haven't been shown to exist. I can understand why some people do believe that. Like, I'm not going to sit there and be blind to the fact of like, I have no, no understanding of why they believe the way they believe. I do understand why they believe what they believe. But once again, to me, it's, you know, to me, science, a lot of science now, like your string theory is, well, give us enough time and we're going to prove it. Give us more time and we'll prove it. Give us more time. Give us more time. And to me, it's the same thing as, um, I don't even know who said this and I stole it from them, but it's like saying, give me enough time and I'll prove that I gave birth to my mother. Like there's, there's some things that you'll never be able to prove. Like I, I will never be able to sit there and a hundred percent prove that God exists. And that's why I don't argue when people sit there and say, well, you need to prove God exists. Well, I can't prove he exists. I can show evidence from what I see why God exists. 
Now you can follow that evidence and take it to where you want. You can either follow it and see where it leads and you say, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. I believe it. Or you can say, well, physicists say if we give them more time, the string theory is going to come to light and this would explain everything. So I'm going to wait for this. Well, I mean, I agree. We don't, we probably will never really, science can't ever prove anything. It's always with some probabilities, but I, like right now, the evidence for string theory is better than the evidence of God. Like we don't need to wait. We can just say, yeah, this theory is right now. It's better right now because all of the parts have been demonstrated. We know for a fact, vacuum states are real. We know for a fact, early universe inflation is real. And if those two things can combine, then string theory would be a result. So this theory seems to be right now, it's better than a God because right now, all of the parts are demonstrated, whereas right now all of the parts of God haven't been demonstrated. Right. And say, you know, back to Occam's razor, what we were saying earlier, to me, it would be like, okay, so physicists say that if we have this, 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 and this, we have all these parts put together, but we can't prove the string theory, but we have all the parts necessary to create a string theory. Or we have an intelligent mind that put everything into motion created human beings to me that's a simpler route to take that's a simpler route it's an easier route can you explain to me how that's simpler because when i think about simplicity it to me it's like if i'm building a theory or whatever the simpler theory is the one that only uses things we know about like if you add in stuff we don't know about that makes it less simple so to me a simpler theory is one that's only using parts which have been demonstrated and string theory does that so string theory is pretty simple whereas if i add in like leprechauns or magic or uh, unicorns things that there's no evidence of or new particles that there's no evidence of that makes the theory less simple and so like if you add in a god who's omniscient omnibenevolent omnipresent or whatever those seem to be very very less simple because you're adding in stuff we don't know about like how are you how do you define simplicity would you like do you define it differently than that well, when we talk about leprechauns, unicorns, magic, like I don't ever include any of that. And it's simple for me because none of those claim to be the creator of the universe. They never, they don't claim to be God. Um, you know, basically there's only three theistic religions out there. And so none of those are leprechauns, unicorns, you know, Zeus, you know. So, sorry, like, just, no, just to interrupt. I'm, I'm not saying they're those, I'm like... I wasn't accusing you of using those in your worldview. My comparison was like, if I have a theory of string theory caused the universe, or if I had a theory of like string theory plus a leprechaun caused the universe. If you add in extra parts to any theory uh, that haven't been demonstrated, that would make it a worse theory. So like string theory versus string theory plus leprechaun, just the string theory is simpler. Um, so if you have string theory or the universe plus God, String theory is simpler because all of the parts in string theory have been demonstrated, whereas the parts in God haven't. So, like, the parts of God aren't have not been demonstrated to exist, just like the parts of a leprechaun have not been demonstrated to exist, or the parts of a unicorn or magic. There isn't any evidence of magic, just like there isn't any evidence of the God empirically, scientifically. Um, and so, if you're using that in a theory, that would be a part of the theory which hasn't been demonstrated yet, which would make it a less simple theory like like leprechauns but i'm not saying there's a leprechaun in your theory anywhere so i'm gonna sound like a broken horse again so we're gonna go back to the jason loves mary i'm not gonna come across a sign written on the sand says jason loves mary and just assume that the waves washed up on the shore and wrote it or a crab did it or a fish did it i'm gonna know an intelligent being did it and so when I look at human beings, when I look at the vastness of the universe, um, for what I consider fine-tuning, it's easier for me to sit there and say an intelligent being created this. Not that it came together by random luck, chance. So what and is so it... to me... Go ahead. Go ahead. So what, what is it about the fine-tuning that is like that? What is it about the fine-tuning that is like Jason Loves Mary? Um... Well, the things that we were talking about earlier, um, I don't have a list of everything here that they consider the fine tuning, but everything from all the stars, the planets being where they are, the planets being the sizes they are, the sun being where it's at, moon being where it's at, 
the earth being exactly where it's at, the tilt of the earth, which we talked about earlier, all this had to be in place, including the Big Bang itself had to happen at an expansion rate, the exact same weight that it had to. For all of that to happen, for us to be here today, I don't think is, I can't chalk that up to a coincidence. Well, like I mean, there are literally thousands of uh, uh, fine tuning arguments. And that's why I'm like, I can't even begin to get into all of them. But, well, I mean, specifically, like, what is it about those that when you look at them, you can identify this is finely tuned versus not finely tuned? Like, how do you identify something that is finely tuned versus not finely tuned? Like, if I look at Jason Loves Mary in the Sand, I can say that was finely tuned because there are no natural forces that can cause that pattern or something like that. Um, but what is the criterion you are using to say this is when we look at the universe, when we look at all the constants you mentioned? Human beings being here. Simplest way to put us being here today, you and I having this conversation today. Well, what about that is finely tuned? Like, wh- like- because if everything what didn't happen exactly the way it did, the way it did, and it's still happening, we wouldn't be here today. So because it's very unlikely, anything that's unlikely is finely tuned? No, not because it's unlikely. It's because if anything was off, just by a little bit, we would not be here today having this conversation. Isn't that so what it's unlikely not like means? It, that could be unlikely. That had to be finely tuned. That had to be created. That's like having, you know, walking up and seeing a, uh, I'm trying to think you're um, losing my thought. I'm old. So coming up and seeing like a mug and just saying, Oh, well, that was just, that was just placed here. That was just here. Nothing created that. It actually fell out of a metal shop and just happened to look that way. Or if I had a pottery mug, oh, it just happened to fall out of a pottery, you know, barn. And and this is how it landed. It was in a perfectly shaped mug with a handle on it and flat base and open in the middle for me to fill up with my coffee. You know, that's to me, it's like, that's, it's more hard to sit there and say, that happened by chance and that's then to say there was a creative there was an intelligent mind behind this creation i'm looking for like a a strict set of criteria on like what would a designed universe versus a non-designed universe look like how would you tell the difference between the two like um not just examples of what is designed like i, I I'm grant that you see humans as designed and that the universe is designed, but I want to know like why, what is like, if you are giving you 10 universes, what are the things you would look for? They'd be like, this one is definitely designed. This one is definitely not designed. Um, how, how would you, cause for me, when I say I can say something is designed if, and only if there is no force that can produce that other than the things we know about of people. So, so like pots or coffee mugs, we know for a fact there is no natural force that produces that. We know for a fact people do produce that. Therefore, I can conclude design. And by using these two factors, I can determine what is and isn't designed. What are the factors you're using to determine that anything is or isn't designed? And what would a non-designed universe look like? I have no idea what a non-designed universe would look like because I don't live in one and I can't create one. So I have no idea what a non-designed... If I was to say what would one look like, it looked like what it did before the Big Bang. There was nothing here. So, so, it, so if the universe did come about by random chance or determined forces, you wouldn't be able to differentiate that from a designed universe. It would still look equally as designed to you because you don't have a way to differentiate necessarily resulting universes from designed universes. No, because people, and that's why I was saying the people is why I said, you know, me and you having this conversation because we are what makes the difference. We are the ones that are here today to sit there and say, if something was designed or if something wasn't designed, if on these other galaxies that you mentioned before, and you said that there was other uh, Earth type at planets and everything else. Now, as far as we know, there's no sentient beings there. We don't know for sure, but as far as we know, there's not. Well, then obviously they can't be extremely fine tuned because. By chance, I'm saying by chance, they can't be finely tuned 
or there would be people there. There would be something living there. There would have to be something. Because if there's billions of other galaxies, and let's say out of these billions, a quarter of them have planets just like Earth. Let's say it's an exact replica of us. They should have beings there. Now, like you said, though, we'll never know because, honestly, I mean, we'll never be able to get to them. We'll never be able to travel the speed of light. But, you know. Well, yeah, yeah I, think saying, that's, I think that's a good point. Like, are, if we if we could travel to all the other planets and found they have the exact same conditions as Earth and for the same amount of time and whatever, but didn't produce life, then, yeah, I think that would definitely be a good reason to conclude life was finely tuned or designed in some kind because something must be different. If all of the other constants are the same and there's no life, then yeah, I think that's a reasonable argument to say that, yeah, life is finely tuned for sure. So, yeah. So that's why, that's what I consider finely tuned. And I believe that because I'm a Christian, obviously in the Bible, you know, and I'm not trying to bring the Bible into our little talk here, but you know, that's why earth has humans. That's why we're here and we're the only ones here. I don't believe that there are other beings. I don't believe there's aliens out there, you know, whatever we want to call them, you know, but so, I believe earth is where we we were born to be. This is where we're supposed to be. So if we did discover aliens and planets with other humans, would that be a challenge for your faith? Would that make it seem like we're not as No, I don't think so because I don't, okay, let me give two part answers here. I don't think so because there would still have to be something that created these other beings. But the reason I don't believe that there's other beings out there, and I used to, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I've no, never, not always been a Christian my whole life. I used to believe in aliens. In fact, I live out in the country, and sometimes me and my wife see some weird stuff flying around out here. And just the other day, we saw something weird, and you know, we still call it UFOs because we're like, what are you going to call it? We don't even yeah. know what it is. Yeah, UFO just means unidentified flying yeah, objects. You know, but you know, mean most alien. Think of little green aliens, yeah. but we're just like, what the heck was that? You know, like we don't know what that was, but we live about two hours from an Air Force base, so I never know what's going on. But uh, the reason I don't believe anything else exists is because I'm a Christian, so I know we've been talking about theistic God, but to the Christian side of God, that would mean that that any being that has free will that God created on all these other planets, they're going to mess up. They're going to sin. So that means that Jesus would literally have to go from planet to galaxy to planet to galaxy and die for all these other beings' sins. And I really don't think that God's going to be like, Let's just keep killing my kid over and over and over, you know, a billion times because there's all these other people out here that are messing up. Yeah, if that makes sense. I'm just trying to sum it up. But what, you don't think Jesus' death on earth would apply to all the other beings in the universe? Like I I think I could do that. That could work. No, no, I don't think it did. I I think it had to, to do with us because um, well, he, he came as a human. He didn't come as whatever else would have been on other planets, and they might have been human. We don't know. But how would they have ever heard of Jesus if he didn't come to their planet? If that makes sense. I mean, yep. I'm just trying to sum it up. Yep. I know it's yep. just like a way thought out there, but I'm just saying this is like, I don't see that happening. So uh, why do you think that our universe must have been designed, but God wasn't? Like, why why can God be a non-designed thing, but the universe can't be a non-designed thing? Because I believe there had to be a first cause on cause. I mean, I agree, but I think that's a part of the universe, like the quantum field. So why do you think yeah, that? Yeah, do you believe? Why do you think, like, yeah. why, why would, like, if I said, who designed God, how would you answer? Nobody. And so why can't I just say nobody designed the quantum field? Why would that be less justified? Because there has to be an intelligent mind to start something. Things don't start on their own. Nothing starts on its own. Right. So God has a nature. God is... Uh, perfectly good, all powerful, all knowing, perfectly moral. Um, that couldn't have not started on its own. It's a very complicated thing. Like for example, for each different way the universe could be, like there could be a universe with only black holes or a universe with only unicorns. Each one of those, there could be a God who could have created the universe exactly that way. So why does God have this particular nature to create a universe exactly this way? It seems like his nature must be finely tuned because there's lots of different ways his nature could be. 
like a universe of only black holes or something. So why is that any different from saying like the universe itself is necessary? Cause there's, it has a finely tuned nature, just like God has a finely tuned nature, but neither one would need to be designed because just because they could be different doesn't necessarily mean they're not necessary. Well, so let me ask some questions first so I can understand what you're saying. So when you say God's nature is finely tuned, I don't know how you're, I don't know how to take that because I don't know exactly what you're saying because to me it's his nature is not finely tuned. It's like, it's saying, um, you know, like, uh, uh, the youth, Euthyphro dilemma, you know, it's like you have those two options where, you know, does God say it's good and that's why it's good or is it good? And so God says it's good. And to me, there's always that dilemma where it's the third option where it's good. It's just God's nature. That's just, that's, that's who he is. That's a part of who he is. It's not something that he does or it's not something that he creates. It's just his part of his nature as in basically, and I'm just, I'm trying to dumb things down. So me saying I'm white, I can't change that. That's just what I am. And it's the same thing with God's nature. He's just good. He, he's, he's good. He's powerful and he's all knowing. So that's just part of his nature. So ask your question again now that you understand where i'm thinking what was your question yeah yeah so when i say god is finely tuned what i mean is that if any of god's properties were even slightly different then life wouldn't exist so like if god was didn't only cared about unicorns then there would be no humans or if god only cared about black holes then there would be no humans or if god uh didn't didn't like potatoes then there would be no humans or something so god's nature could be different if it was even slightly different then there would be no humans. There'd be no life. Um, so just like when you say that if the gravitational constant was even slightly different, there would be no life. If God's nature was even slightly different, there would be no life. And so we could imagine a God who only created black holes. That's a possibility. So it seems like God's nature is equally as fine tuned as the gravitational constant is fine tuned. But that's only a possibility. If you believe that God's nature could have been slightly different. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like from a Christian's perspective or a theistic God's perspective, God can't be different because he's a perfect being. If a perfect being can't change, there's no reason to change because they're perfect. They don't lack anything. They don't need anything. So your, your question only works if in the thought of you believe God can change or if he wants to change something, which God doesn't change anything because he's a perfect being. So I, I can't, I don't have much to give you on that because. Oh, that's perfect. So, so can't we say the same thing about the universe though? Like you say, the reason the universe is finely tuned is because it could be different. I could just reply the same thing you did and say, well, that's only if you think the universe could be different. Maybe the universe couldn't be different in which case but it can. Well, so the, one second before we get to there. So I can say that the universe could not be different and then it wouldn't be fine tuned anymore. It, the fine tuning problem would be gone now just because just for the same reason that you think because God could not have been different, God isn't finely tuned. I could say because the universe could not be different, the universe is not finely tuned. And then you would of course say, well, it can be different. And then I would say, well, God can be different too. God could have only created a universe of only black holes or only wanted unicorns or whatever. So it seems like, why would you say that God being, not being able to be different is any more likely than the universe not being able to be different? Because it seems like they could both be different. Because the God that created the universe and the God that created human beings and created morality can't be different because if he was different then the laws of physics like the laws of nature the laws of physics you know none of these could exist if his nature changed like if, if laws of physics were constantly changing we couldn't perform science there's just no way if the laws of physics and the laws of nature and you know all the known laws that we do have, the laws of thermodynamics, you know, whatever is constantly changing. 
or you know even like the 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 speed of light if the speed of light was to change from 186,000 miles per second or whatever it is to let's say tomorrow it decided to change to 100,000 miles per second well there's a lot of science that we couldn't use no more because the laws are constantly changing on us and so if god's nature could constantly change then we can and, and that's what i'm saying you you have to I don't know how to say this. Um, um, God's nature can't change. If God's nature changed, then we wouldn't have morality. We wouldn't have the laws that we have now because everything had to be grounded in something. Everything has to be grounded. If it's not grounded in something, then we can perform any type of science. Like we have to perform science off the things that we know are grounded in the laws of physics and the laws of nature. And so if God's nature itself changed, if, and if God is true and if God is real, then we wouldn't be able to perform anything because all of it would be na- grounded in his nature. So, so two things there. One is that, uh, so I'm not bringing up God's nature changing. I'm saying God, there could have been a God who was just always different than what you imagine the Christian God to be like. And if there was a different God, there would, yes, there would be different laws of physics. I think that's what fine tuning means. Fine tuning means that if they were, if there was a different thing, then you would have different outcomes. So the reason the universe is finely tuned is because if the the gravitational constant was different, you'd have a different, the the universe would look very different. Like that's what makes it fine tuned. So it seems like God's nature is also finely tuned and that if God's nature changed any bit, then it would be a totally different universe. I totally agree. But why is that a problem? Why is it a problem to imagine a, there was a different kind of a God who could have made, because if go ahead, because if God is true and if God is real and all the attributes of God are true, that he's perfect, he's all-knowing, and everything else. If all that is true, and then you got, on the other side, what you're saying is you have the universe. Well, the universe we know is dying. We know sooner or later it's going to go into heat death. We know that for a fact. So therefore, I guess it's hard for me to sit there and say, well, it could be the same as God because no, because if all the attributes of God that what I've said so far are true, then God will never die. He will never pass away. But this universe will. And we know that for a fact. Well, so what I'm asking is, is like the gravitational constant is one way and it could be a different way. It could change. Why can't God's nature also be like a dial where it could have been differently? So like, why does it like God could have a different morality where he values not people or lizards or something or a different thing he cares about like black holes. So God's nature is just like the gravitational constant in that it can change. Whereas you seem to be saying, no, God's nature could only be one way. And I'm asking why can it only be one way? Why couldn't there have been a different God who could have been a different way? Probably not going to like my answer. So, because of us being here right now and everything that's happened right now couldn't be different than what it already is. If it was, then God would not be perfect because that means God would have had to change something. So, therefore, God can't change. If God would change, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be talking right now if God could change his nature. But God doesn't have to change because it is perfect. Am I making sense? Yeah, that sounds a lot like the anthropic principle in physics. Um, The anthropic principle is that um, any consideration of the structure of the universe has to take into account of what it looks like now. So, but you can say that about nature too. You can say, well, nature couldn't be different because if nature was different, we wouldn't have what we have now. And we do have what we have now. Therefore, nature couldn't have been different but obviously that's a silly argument because you can say of course it could be different you could just change the gravitational constant like if you can imagine it changing therefore it could have been different well it seems like just like you can imagine the gravitational constant changing i can imagine god's nature changing so what is it about 
God that, or the universe, what's the difference between God and the universe here, where you can imagine one changing and then conclude, therefore it's able to change, what, and it do, that doesn't apply to the other one? Because something had to create one or the other. If, if God didn't create the universe, then he's not God. Something has to be the first cause on cause. Something has to be at the beginning. Something has to give rise to one or the other. You can't have two things come into existence. Like for me sitting there saying it's God, you saying it's the universe. Both of those couldn't have happened at the same time. One had to start the other. Right. And we know the universe doesn't have a mind. It doesn't have, you know, it can't pick and choose. It's just random chance. According to you, it's just random chances. So something had to give it a divine start. Now, as far as God changing, like I said, if he did change and if he could change, then I'm worshiping the wrong God. I mean, that's all there is to it. Yeah. If God could change his nature in any form or fashion, I would be worshiping the wrong God. It's like I tell people all the time. They're like, well, how do you know the Christian God's the right God? Well, there's only two ways. Either Jesus rose from the dead and that's true. Or if they find Jesus' body, game over. Christianity is not true. I'm worshiping the wrong God. I mean, it's that simple. All right. So let, let's just grant for the sake of the argument, there is a God. Let's just, no, no universe possibility. Um, and I say God is finely tuned. And the reason God is finely tuned is because he could be different. So, we, so we're granting God exists. Like we're in heaven. We're at a coffee shop in heaven. And we see God to the left. Like God's over there. And I'm like, God's finely tuned. He could be different. Because I can imagine his properties being changed. And you would say, no, he can't be different because why? Because he wouldn't be God. Sure, that would be that would be kind of the point. Because the way he is right now, he's perfect. So if he was to be different, he wouldn't be God. Okay, now now we're going back to the universe hypothesis. I could say the reason the universe couldn't be different is because it's perfect and it can't if it was any different, it wouldn't be the universe. Well, it's not perfect. It's just finely tuned. Well, I could say this. I could go back and say the same thing about God. God isn't perfect. He's just finely tuned. But if he wasn't perfect, he wouldn't be God. <laughs> yes, but I can say the same thing. If the universe wasn't perfect, it wouldn't be the universe. Do you see why that doesn't seem, that's not really a compelling argument when you change it to. No, because I think that you're confusing. And I'm not saying you're confusing or maybe I'm con getting confused, but I think you're confusing t to me is perfect and fine tuning. I think the universe is fine tuned, but I don't think there's a physicist in the world that would say the universe is perfect, but it's perfectly ordained. It's perfectly here. I don't think there's, I'm, I'm not going to say there's not, I just haven't heard one say it's perfect, you know? So I think there's a difference between saying something's fine tuned and then something's perfect. I can finally tune my vehicle but my vehicle isn't a perfect running machine. It's going to die, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm, I'm, that's what I'm asking about here is what is the difference between perfect and fine tuning? Cause it seems to be arbitrary. It seems to be that you're just labeling God as perfect because that's what you, you, you believe is perfect. Whereas someone else could just label the universe as perfect because that's what they believe is perfect. Um, and, and so what is, yeah. what is the difference? How do you tell the difference between the two? Because something that's perfect doesn't have to change. That's the difference for me. The universe is constantly changing. The laws of physics? No, not the laws of physics, but the universe itself. Like the universe is, it's, you know, slowly dying. It's, if, it was a, if it was perfect, it wouldn't die. If it was perfect, we wouldn't have stars exploding, becoming black holes. They would just stay shined forever because it would be perfect. It's not perfect. It's just finely tuned for life to exist on Earth. So, so, so when why, you sit there and say, "Why ahead. couldn't we say the the laws of physics are perfect because they don't change?" So the laws of physics, the quantum field, that's true. They don't change. Can't we say those are perfect? I would say those are perfect, as far as we know right now, unless they discover something else. Remember, we're trying to tell the difference between perfect and finely tuned. So, if they are perfect and God is perfect, then they couldn't have been different. So, so wouldn't that mean that we could just say the laws of physics don't need to be 
finely tuned. They're not created because they're not finely tuned. They're perfect. No, because laws have to be given by lawmakers. Laws uh, just don't come in existence by themselves. Something had to create laws. Uh, okay, well, in, in my understanding, laws in physics aren't created. They're, by definition, just regularities of nature. So laws in the legal system have to be created. But in all of science, when someone says law, they mean not created. That means irregularity in nature. So I, I don't think in science they use law in that way. See, I think all the laws are grounded in God's nature. All the laws that we use are grounded in God's nature. The laws of logic, the laws of physics, the laws of nature, I think they're grounded in his nature. Sure. I don't think he created them. I just think they're an attribute of his nature. Okay, but what I was saying was that um, I grant that in a legal system, for a law to exist, somebody must have created it. Absolutely. If there's a, a, a legal law, somebody has to have created it. Um, but in physics, laws don't mean that. So why do you think that you said, if there is a law, there must be a lawgiver? In the legal system, 100% agree with you. In science, doesn't seem to be the case. Like We don't have any examples of any laws in physics that have ever been created. Um that's, of course, what you believe, of course. But I, in a legal system, you can definitely say that there's lots of evidence if there's a law and a legal system must have been created. But in physics and science, that's never been the case. Um, so why would you think that this principle that applies to a legal system would also apply to any time anyone says the word law? So it's not the word law. It's just... I guess it's an easier analogy for people, but it's not the word law. It's just like the laws of logic. We'll just use those for right now. The laws of logic, if they are grounded in human minds, then they can change. If they're grounded on human concepts, it can change. But the laws of logic can't change. So it has to be grounded outside of something other than the human mind. Because if that was the case, then your laws of logic could be different from my laws of logic. But yet we both know there's only one set of laws of logic that are true. And so for to get to the truth, there has to be something outside of the human mind, the outside of the human concept of the laws of logic to create the laws of logic for all of us to know what the laws of logic are. And we can sit there and, you know, someone could sit there and say, well, you know, well, that's true for you, but not for me, you know, but we know that's not true. You know, if, if you use just basic common sense, you know, that's not true. And so there has to be something outside of our minds that created the laws for all of us to know what these laws are. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. I think that the laws of logic are languages that humans made up to describe reality. So you can you could change the laws of logic to say A is not A or something. It would just not be right. true. It would be false. And the reason it would be false is because it doesn't describe reality. It's not that reality made A equals A. But, it's that reality is A equals A. So like if I said... But uh, the who's reality? Who's, there's a, only one. Like reality is everything that exists. There isn't like a subjective reality. It's, it's all reality. Well, but like, like, uh, let's go to, uh, the reason I say whose reality is because let's say Stalin's reality, his reality is obviously far different from my reality. He believed in let's kill all the people or, you know, Hitler, let's kill all the people that are, you know, that are maimed and everything else, because it's going to be better for our world. That was his reality. That was his truth. That's his reality. And you can't tell him that because that's, you can't tell him, no, that's not right because that's his reality, but that's not your reality. But we all know what Hitler did was wrong. So therefore we have to know that there is something outside of all of our minds that are telling us this ain't right. Because if we were basing the laws of logic for instance, like what we were just using or any of the laws off of our own thoughts of what you said, reality, 
who's reality? Well, it's not thoughts. So, so reality is reality and no one gets an opinion on it. There is reality. And I can make sentences that describe reality. I can say like, there is a tree outside. That, that's, that is a sentence that describes reality. And I can change the sentence. I can say, there is not a tree outside. Now that sentence would be wrong. It would be false because it doesn't describe reality. Logic works the exact same way. If I say A equals A, that is true because it describes reality. And if I say A does not equal A, that is false because it does not describe reality. The laws of logic don't exist. They're languages humans made up just like English, but some of them describe reality and some of them don't describe reality. Like uh, math, you can do the same thing. There's math that describes reality, one plus one equals two. There's math that doesn't describe reality, like F equals MA times 37. F equals MA is um, Newton's, one of Newton's laws, and if you just add times 37, it just stops describing reality. And there's math that's self-contradictory, like saying one plus one equals seven, it, it contradicts itself. Just like English, English has sentences that describe reality, there is a tree outside, sentences that do not describe reality, um, there is not a tree outside, and sentences that are self-contradictory, I am a married bachelor. So math and logic are languages just like English and they don't like exist outside of our minds, but there is something outside of our minds telling us if they are right, which is reality. If they describe reality, they're right. And if they don't describe reality, they're not right, but they don't need like a mind or anything out there. It's just, does this language that we've constructed describe reality or not? Hmm. So Going back to reality. So let's say I have, I saw this demonstration a long time ago. So let's say I have a Dr. Pepper 20, 20 ounce bottle in my hand and you're standing on one side of it and I'm standing on the other side and someone's standing dead middle and someone asks the dead middle person, ask person in the middle says to me, what do you see? Dr. Pepper. They ask you, what do you see? You start reading off all the ingredients because that's what you see. That's your reality. And this is my reality at the time. So there can be different realities. It's just from someone's perspective. If that makes any sense. Sure. So there can be different realities, but there's only one truth. Right. And that one truth is what I mean is grounded in, the, in God's nature. There only can be one law of logic. There only can be one truth. And the truth is, is we both see the same things. We're just seeing it from different perspectives. And that's what I'm saying. I don't know if you're, if I'm taking your word for reality, right? Or maybe I'm misconstruing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think like reality to me doesn't mean a subjective perception, like a subjective perception or what I see isn't reality. Reality is everything that exists independent of what anybody sees. So reality would be like God would be in reality because he exists or doesn't exist, whatever one or whichever, all of the things that exist would be, that's what reality means. Reality, the word reality means all things that exist. So do you believe the laws of logic would exist if no human beings were here? Uh, no, but they would still describe reality. So the laws of logic are a language that humans made up to describe reality. So reality would exist if no humans existed and the laws of logic would still describe reality, but no one, the laws of logic themselves are just sentences that we made up. So it's like saying, would dinosaurs exist? If humans didn't, I mean, of course they would, but the word dinosaur wouldn't exist because we made up the word dinosaur. The laws of logic are like the word dinosaur. So you're saying, so I'm just trying to understand where you're at. So you're saying if no human beings were here and if I said, and if there's one rock on earth and I said, there's one rock on earth. That would, would that still, still be, be true? true. Yes. So, but you don't think that those laws have to be grounded in a mind somewhere? No, the rock doesn't have a mind, but the rock is still existing. No, not the rock. The laws of logic. Well, oh, that's what I mean. Like you can say all of reality, think it's just rocks or whatever. Say there's no mind. All of reality can still exist and you can still make sentences like there is a rock over there. That rock is bigger than that rock. And all of those statements will still be true even if there's no mind, even if no mind created the universe, if there's just a universe, a mindless universe all of the sentences would still be true about it. So you don't need a mind to ground logic. You just need something to exist. If anything exists, then the fact that it exists can ground logic and math because logic and math would then describe the thing that exists. 
So I'm just trying to understand where you're at. So you're saying the laws of logic, laws of mathematics, physics, none of those things have to be grounded in anything. They just are. Well, they have to be grounded in describing something that exists. So if something exists, math and logic are then grounded as languages to describe the thing that exists. But it can be grounded in anything that exists. If anything exists, then that can ground math and logic. So why couldn't that thing be God? It could be. I never said it couldn't be. Hey, so we got somewhere. Sure. You're saying it could be. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't think oh, God I'll is. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll I don't think it. God is impossible. I'll take it. Okay. Okay. I'll take it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not somebody who says God <laughs> is impossible for sure. That would be like God is a round square. It's not possible. So, but... and that's and that's the same with me when it comes to Christianity. Like I tell people all the time, they're like, you know, how do you know Christianity? Like I was telling you earlier, how do you know Christianity is right? It could. It might not be. I might be worshiping the wrong God. I don't. I don't think I am from the studying I've done, but. Sure, they find the body of Jesus Christ. Game over. Christianity's false. I've been sure. I better go look for Muhammad or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if we die and we don't meet God, that would also disprove it too, right? There you go. Yep. If we yep. die and there's nothing left, that Christianity is falsifiable. But you know, like um, and I forgot the philosopher that said it. You might know, honestly. I, I forgot his name. I'm sure I got it on a slide somewhere. But to me, when it boils down to it and And I'll be the first to say it. I have a son that's on the edge, you know, about Christianity or just God in general. And, um, and like I've told him, I was like, but if, if you, if you understand God, like through the Bible and don't go off of what people say, and I'm not saying you do this, but I'm saying for other people that sit there and like, oh, you know, God's evil, God's this and that. Now, if you read the Bible, he's not evil. He's a very loving God, but you do have to understand the Bible. You do have to read it for, you can't just read it at face value and be like, oh, this is what it is. If you study it and read it and understand it, and you know God's loving, then why not live as if there is a God? So that way, if you do pass away, you know, you get to go to heaven or, you know, like you, you seem like a very nice man, everything else, you know, and, you know, if, if you don't choose to follow God, that's your choice, you know, and I'm sure you've heard other people say, it, you know, God's not going to force you into heaven for all eternity against your will. So he lets you choose where you want to be. And so I just told, like I tell my son, in fact, I just told him I had this conversation with him this morning. I'm like, why wouldn't you want to rather be in a place of paradise and be with God and not be with him when I told him, I was like, you're a good kid. You're, you're doing good things. You know, you're living a good life. I'm like, so why not just look into it? And I mean, but he's yeah. 25. So I think that's Pascal's <laughs> wager. Pascal's the philosopher. There we go. Know. Thank you. Thank you. Pascal's wager. Yes. Yeah. So, so my take on Pascal's wager is that it's equally as likely that believing in God would get you to heaven as not believing in God. Like there could be a God who could only let atheists into heaven, like an atheist God, or there could be a heaven with no God. Like there's possible afterlives that don't have anything to do with the God. There's supernatural ones, natural ones. There's all kinds of different abilities for there to be an afterlife with or without a God. And if you think that the act of believing would get you an afterlife, it seems equally as likely to me that the act of believing in a God And the act of not disbelieving in a God, both of those seem to be equally as likely to get you into heaven. So why do you think that the act of believing in a God would make it more likely to get you into heaven? It's not that the believing in God is what gets you into heaven. And I think that's a big misconception. It's not the, it's not believing in Jesus that, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. I, I don't believe that. What gets what throws us into hell is our sin. Sin is like a cancer, you know. If a person dies, well, why do they die? They had cancer. Well, why do we go to hell? Because we have we have cancer, we have sin. And so it's just believing in Jesus will cure you of that sin, will cure you of that cancer, and you will spend eternity in God's presence. And so for people and people ask us all the time and sometimes it's it catches you off guard you know and when people stand up and they'll say stuff like um so i don't believe in god am i going to hell 
Yeah. No, no, I will never tell somebody that. But I mean, it's like, no, yeah, you're going it, to hell because your nose is just ugly. That's why you're going to hell. Yeah. It? Yeah. It's just because you're retarded, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, but I tell people, it's, <clears throat> I tell people, I'm like, it's not for me to say who's going to heaven or who in hell. But what I will say is, if you don't want God now, why do you think, and if, if I'm claiming God's all loving, that's my God. And if he's all loving, why would he force you into his presence for all eternity when you don't want nothing to do with him? And so hell is the exact opposite. You're just out of his presence for all of eternity. You're just not in his presence no more. And so everyone on earth, whether atheist or Christian or not, to me, we all get God's grace because we're all still here. It's just, you know, when we're all gone, it's whether you know, if you're going to spend an eternity with them or without him. And so, but from what you're saying though, what you were talking earlier. So you say you're an atheist, but you're saying that you're not denying there's any possibilities. So are you agnostic atheist? Uh, no. So I think it's more reasonable to conclude there is not a God, but you can't like prove it with hundred percent certainty. So I think that right. the more reasonable position is to conclude that God is a thing made up by human minds. Like, Harry Potter or leprechauns or something. I think that is the, the, the conclusion that is supported by the most evidence. But you said there's a possibility. You're, sure. You said that there could be. But yeah. I mean, I think it's possible. But not, not a theistic God. Cause you're talking about afterlives and everything else. So that wouldn't be a theistic God. That'd be more of a, uh, both, just a God in general. Both would be possible. So like a deistic God who doesn't care about you, that's possible. A pantheistic God where nature itself has some divine quality, that's possible. Panentheism, panindeism, uh, polytheism, those are all possible. Um, but it's like, I, I think leprechauns are possible. Like it's possible there's little invisible green men going around planting gold, but I don't, I think it's more reasonable to conclude that they don't exist. So I can't prove they don't, it's possible. But the evidence right. includes that they're probably just something humans made up. So I think that even though it's possible, the evidence indicates it's most likely not the case. I got you. So you believe that. So let's get back to your naturalism because you're a naturalist, right? Yep. Naturalism. Yep. Okay. So, and help me understand. So how do you, think that naturalism is more of an explanation instead of being a materialist well, well materialists are a kind of naturalist um but there can be so other... you're just kind of combining the two i guess no not exactly so like uh all flowers are roses but not all roses are flowers so you know like there are kinds of flowers that aren't roses so all materialists are naturalists but not all naturalists are materialists so there's kinds of naturalists that are go beyond materialism but it's still all natural stuff Okay. So uh, my, my view is called naturalistic pantheism, which is that there is an eternal, all-powerful law of nature, quantum field thingy, that is out there. And it can be beyond material, that's fine. So I'm not a part of the materialist naturalist necessarily. Um, but yeah, so my view is called naturalistic pantheism, eternal, all-powerful, na natural thing. Gotcha. Interesting. And so you believe this naturalism, these subatomic particles and the quantum fields and in these quantum fields by random chance came together and well, I'd say necessity. I would say that they're, they have a necessary nature that couldn't be different. And because of their necessary nature, they would create the universe. So not chance. But what created their nature to be like that? It is uncreated. It is necessary. It's always been there. Is there evidence for this? Uh, the parts, again, the parts of quantum fields have been demonstrated to exist. So in that sense, yes. The combination, again, no. So kind of like the string theory, kind of yep. Yep. the parts are all there, but it haven't been put together yet? Yep. Okay. I'm going to have to do some research into that. Yeah, I think uh, my favorite one is just to Google emergent space-time. That's one of the things in physics people are working on. And naturalistic... Emergent space-time? Yes, emergent space-time. And naturalistic pantheism 
is in the section of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on pantheism. So if you just Google Stanford pantheism and then just go down the page, there's a section for naturalistic pantheism. Okay, I totally lost that when I was listening to you talk. Emerge, what was the, you told me to Google again? Emergent space time. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have to look this up. Cool. Oh, you mentioned the Euthyphro Dilemma. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that because my yes. understanding of the Euthyphro Dilemma is either something is good because God deems it good or it's good for some other reason than God deems it good. Correct. Why is that a false dilemma? Because there's a third option, and that's because goodness is God's nature. Well, that would be the second option. So the first option is, is something good because God says it's good? And, this, and the second option is, is something good for any other reason than God says it's good? If you're saying it's God's nature, that would be something different than God said so. That's God's nature. Well, the, the Euthyphro dilemma is kind of like what you were saying. Okay, so does God say it's good because it's good? Or is it good because God says so? But it's, it's so those are good the same because thing. it's... So, so... You did I say dilemma? That backwards? Maybe yeah. I did. Well, so, so let me. So, so, the way I understand it is, the Euthyphro dilemma started from uh, a Socrates dialogue where he says, "Is yes. the pious pious because the gods love it, or do the gods love it because it is pious?" And the way that translates yes. into um, the God debate is, "Is something good because God says so, or did God say it's good because it's good based off some independent criterion?" So, is it only good because God says so? Or is there some independent criterion that makes it good, and that's why he said so? Because what we're saying is, in simpler terms, is is it good because God said it was? Or did God say it was good because he just thought so? No, those would be the same thing. Basically. Those would be those would be the same thing. Well, no, because you're saying so basically if I saw a cat and said oh that's good so that would be god saying this is a good thing or is something good and god says it's good it's something good and then god says it's good so it's already good and then god said so because it's already good yeah and so what i'm saying is the third option is it's not him saying either or it's just in his nature right um so, so forget the euthyphro dilemma and just answer my version so we can consider this my version the t jump version of the euthyphro dilemma is something be good only because god said so or did god say it was good because there's this set of criteria that you can determine whether or not something's good and god looked at that criteria and said yes this is good no there is no criteria it's just in his nature wouldn't that would be the criteria so the criteria is is there is this non-conscious nature of god and god can look in and see his nature and say this is the good thingy and then he can look at this other thing and say does this thing match his nature yes or no and so he's like yes this matches my nature or no this does not match my nature so he's not just saying i like this therefore it's good he's saying if that you say it, if you say it, you're if you say it the way you're phrasing it then there's no euthyphro dilemma well, the dilemma would be that if God is looking at his internal non-conscious nature and saying that I can look at this and know what is good, then you don't need consciousness for goodness. So like you can say there is this nature, there's this nature of you, the universe or whatever, and it's good. Um, so, so the dilemma is that if God, if something is only good because God said it, then goodness is arbitrary. And if something is good not because of God's conscious nature, not because of a conscious decision, but some other non-conscious thing like God's nature, then you don't need a consciousness for morality. You can have a non-conscious thing ground morality. Hold on, I'm trying to look this up. Where is it at? Where is it at? Where is it at? <laughs> Who's 
Well, that was no help. What are you looking up? Oh, I had some notes I put in here somewhere, and I'm trying to figure out where I put them. And it's about the Euthyphro dilemma. I talked about this in my book. Can you do like a control F search for Euthyphro? Yeah, so I'm trying to do. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I was trying to find. I can't find it. Let's see. Maybe this is it. So, okay, so the Euthyphro Dilemma, the way I understand it is this, is, uh, I, don't even, I can't even find what I was looking for, but uh, the, way, the way I find it is this, is uh, basically, is this good because God says it is, or um, or because, okay, hold on. What is it? I'm trying to. I wish I had my book out here. Oh, the way you said it before was: Is something good because God said it is, or is it good and therefore God said it was? So basically, the way you're saying it is almost as if God is having to look uh, beyond innate, like beyond something else, to say if something's good. Right. That's the, so the reason I bring this up is because William Lane Craig and Frank Turek, when they address this, they completely miss the point. Like all of the academic philosophers are like, that has nothing to do with the actual dilemma. Like that it's just, you, you just apply the dilemma to the same thing. That's why I bring this up because the real dilemma, the, what it's really asking is, is it good because God said so? Just like his opinion. Does he have an opinion? I think it's good. Therefore it's good. Or is there something more than his opinion? something outside of his consciousness that's determining whether this is good, and which would be like his nature. That's fine. You can say it's his nature, and that wouldn't be the same as saying it's just a, a whim, a conscious whim. Um, and so in philosophy, in the academic philosophy, what they're asking is, is something good only because God says so? That's it. The only reason. God says so, that's what makes it good. Or is there more to it? Is it some other feature that isn't a conscious decision that makes it good? Is it beyond, so like in, in philosophy, a true dichotomy is either P or not P. Uh, and then this question is, is it something, is it God's whim or not God's whim that makes something good? But I don't think it's found upon like, um, like his consciousness. I believe it's just his nature. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. So I do know what you're talking about. I do know what you're talking about with uh, Frank Turk and William Lynch Craig. I, I've seen it many times and. Sometimes, honestly, when they answer it, it kind of confuses me when they give their answers. So I do know what you're saying. And I'm trying to not say it the same way as them. So, Well, I think your answer is fine. To, I think if you want to say that. To me, it's not a dilemma because it's either, okay, if you want to break out, like, you know, Frank Turk uses it and William Lane Craig uses it. And I actually just used it about there's a third option. Yep. There's not a third option. Let's just break it down to this. It's either, does God have to figure out if something's good? Does he have to look to something above himself? Or is it just part of his nature? It's, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's really what it boils down to. Is it just part of who he is? Or is it that he has to decide if something's good? If that makes sense. Yep. Like, is he having to come to a conscious decision like, um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we could call that good. Or is it just part of who he is? Yeah. And so to me, it's just, it's just goodness. It's just a part of his nature. It's just a part of who he is. He doesn't have to decide it. He doesn't have to think about it. It's like, you know, for, for, for us, for instance, I'm not telling, you know, um, blood cells inside my body right now to keep recreating, creating blood cells that create my skin to be white. They just do it. It just, it is what it is. <laughs> Yeah. And so I think that's the way it is with God's nature. It just, it is what it is. It's his nature. Yeah, that's perfectly you fine. Know? So I, I would just say that that means you don't need consciousness for morality. So like normally 
in the moral debate, um, they say that, well, you need morality to be grounded in the consciousness. And that's when I usually bring up the Euthyphro dilemma, because if you don't, if God, if morality can be grounded in God's nature and it's not his conscious decision, you don't need a conscious decision, then morality can, can be grounded in like a law of nature, physics nature. So you can say, okay, if morality can be grounded in God's nature and he doesn't have to think about it, then it could also be grounded in nature's nature and it doesn't need a mind to think about it either. So you can also have objective morality without a God. That's usually the way I use the argument. So you think you can have objective morality without God? Yes. I have a model of objective morality. So most fun fact, most philosophers are atheists, like 70% or something. And most philosophers believe in objective morality. So I think it's 60% or something. So most philosophers who are atheists also believe in objective morality. Yes. So where do you think morality comes from? Uh, there's my model is a law of physics, kind of like gravity. I think it's a thing in the universe. Most philosophers say it's either like there's a platonic object theory. There's a a priori abstract theory. Um, there's a naturalistic realism theory, moral realism. Um, there's a whole bunch of different moral theories of what they think it could be. My personal, what I think it is, is it's an undiscovered law of nature. So you think it's an undiscovered law of nature? Yes. So how would it be grounded in our minds? It's not. It has nothing to do with the human. Or do you, how do we? How does it get to our minds? Like or our brains. Yeah. So do you believe in minds or do you believe in brain? Uh, I think those are the same thing. I think minds and brains okay. are the okay. same. Okay. So, so okay. I think like gravity affects us because it goes through the universe and hits us. I think that the moral law is the same thing. It goes through the universe and hits our brains and it, we feel it. And so what about people that break those laws? What do you uh, think of those people? The, the law doesn't... Like serial, serial killers, rapists... Well, it's like gravity. You can jump. Like you, you can you can go up. We can fly. We can go to space. We can go against the law. Though. Well, you can go to space permanently. You can just keep going. Yeah, if you jump out of the plane. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so so, so, the there are, so if there's a law that is weak enough, it doesn't force you to obey it. It You can go against it. So the moral law is weak enough that it doesn't force you to obey it, and you can go against it. I've never heard someone think that. Sorry, that's interesting to me. Yeah, you can look more about that's, it by going for moral yeah, realism. I've never heard... Uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has a page called Moral Realism, uh, or Moral Naturalism, Moral Naturalism, where you can read more about it. And it's it's a study of how they are trying to prove, I guess. Is that what they're trying to do? They're trying to prove that morality is a, a law? Uh, it, it's philosophy. So they're describing all of the possibilities of how morality can exist without a God, moral naturalism. It's, their morality is a natural phenomenon of the world. Huh. And how are they trying to say? Because you're saying that your opinion, you said, was you believe it's a law. So what are they trying to claim? Uh, the same thing? That it's a law? Yeah, laws is one of them. Platonic objects is another one. Um, uh, a priori abstract is another one. So there's a lot of, there's a big, there's a lots of different possibilities of ways to get objective morality without a god. So when being cruel and mean and and is more favorable most of the time, why would the law of morality care? Uh, the law of morality... Like, for instance, for me, from my existence, if I want to say I want to go rob a bank and kill some people and take their stuff, and that's going to help me survive. So why would that be wrong. Well, wrong and survive isn't the same thing. Like just because something helps you to survive doesn't make it right. So, so it's like, it's two different laws. Well, There's... Well, like, I mean, you can just skip the analogy. I'm just trying to say like, for instance, how, how come when people do bad things, like for instance, rape, why is rape wrong? If rape is really just helping us to propagate the world. Because it goes against the moral law. So even though it might help with biology, it still goes against the moral law, so it's wrong. So it's like if but I there said... There can't be a... There, there can't... I can't wrap my mind around that there's a they, that there's a law that sits there and tells us what's right and wrong. Why? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, I'm, I don't know if I'm losing you or what, but that just doesn't... Like, I can't wrap my mind around that. 
why does that not make sense? Like, can you imagine there is a law of physics that interacts with our brain and causes us to have certain feelings? There's a law? Yeah. Not believing there's chemicals inside of us that react, that can give us feelings. Right. Yes. So those would include, like, it can give us moral feelings too, right? Yeah, but that would be the same thing as moral relativism. So somebody in Africa, you know, that lives in a tribe that says raping and sacrificing these babies is what we do, but they will never know that they're wrong unless somebody tells them they're wrong. Unless you can... So why isn't the moral law hit them? The laws of morality hit them. Well, it's the same reason why people can... Some people can see more spectrums of light than others. So the fact that our biology has not been designed enough to be affected by it means that some people will be more affected by it or more aware of it than others. Like animals, I don't think are as affected by it as humans. They aren't as like driven by the law because their cognitive abilities of their brain haven't developed enough where they can actually feel it and develop it as much. So just like any other thing in nature, some animals, some species can be more aware of it than others. So are the laws of morality, and I'm asking you because your opinions, so are the laws of morality, do they evolve? No, just our awareness of them evolves. And you think they've just always been here? Yep, just like gravity and the other laws of physics. So before the creation of the universe, you believe the laws of morality were around? Yep. But nothing created them. They've yep. just always been. Yep. So it's almost, it's like easier for me to understand, like, I guess, uh, for me, what I'm hearing, and I mean, I'm not, I understand you're an atheist, so I'm, I'm not trying to insult you here. So what I'm trying to say, though, is it's almost sounds like, like you have your, like a set of gods. Yeah, you like, in a way, just, there's... Like, like there's, they're just different forms. Like you got the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the laws of logic, the laws of morality. These are gods to you because they have always been here. They've always been around. Nothing created them and they'll never go away. Yeah. Like everyone thinks there's a necessary thing that's always been there. Nobody thinks there is literally nothing. So everybody has a, a necessary thing. The reason it's not a God is because there's no consciousness. It's not a conscious entity. That's the only thing that doesn't make it a God. So like it's still a cult of naturalistic pantheism. So there's still a necessary thing there. Um, all of the different versions of theism, pantheism, dilotheism, or dilotheism doesn't, but henotheism, uh, deism, theism, polytheism, they all have a necessary thing that exists. They're just not all gods because God has a mind and this one doesn't have a mind. I got you. Just being honest, you're the first atheist I've ever talked to that's said that. So, Yeah, it's because I spend a lot of was, time. That's why I was, I was like, sounds like gods, but just not same God. Yeah, most atheists just call it nature because they hate the word God. They have lots of bad experiences. And so because I spend a lot of time and a lot of friends who are, who are mine who are theists, I try to make the language of the atheist worldview as understandable to the theist as possible. And so, yeah, you can say the universe is a God. That's called pantheism. Pantheism is where the universe is a God. So, yeah, I, I try to incorporate as much religious language so it makes sense to people as much as possible. So I'm happy to say, yes, universe is God. Yes. Got it. That's pretty interesting. I'm going to do a little bit of studying probably tonight on things we were talking about. Yeah. Do you have a little more time? Because there's one more topic. You mentioned morality sure. was Go the ahead. last argument. So morality. Um, I definitely see the Old Testament God as a moral because I have a model of objective morality. My morality okay. is... Um, we look at our moral intuitions as the phenomenon. We observe that there is this thing we call morality. We try to find a pattern in that thing. And we describe that pattern with the principle, which is any involuntary position of will is immoral. Uh, and then we say that that pattern, that principle is described by some law of nature. And if we think that this is correct, then like the world flood drowning millions of babies in the global flood or whatever, or destroying Sodom and Gomorrah or turning people to salt causing wars, uh, all of those things seem to be something immoral that the God has done um, by my my model of objective morality would say the God is immoral. So why do you think that 
those things are not immoral in the Christian worldview. So we'll take one of those, the, the flood. Now, if you were to ask me, why did God use a flood to destroy the world instead of just vanquishing them out of reality? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us why he used a flood. That's the Pine Creek thing, right? To be honest. I have no clue why he just didn't vanquish them all. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm not God. Um, do I think it was immoral for him to do this? No, because if God is who he says he is, the Bible says that God searched the world and not one was righteous. Noah and his family were the only ones that he had found to be righteous. The rest of the people were off. They were sacrificing their babies. They were raping people. They were incesting. They were having sex with animals. Pretty much almost everything that's going on in today's world is kind of scary. But so none were righteous. Now, I understand you're saying like, wow, but everybody, <laughs> I mean, once again, I'm not God, but he, if God is who he says he is, he said nobody was found righteous. So that comes to the point of would we today, would we find rapists, murderers, people that sacrifice babies, people that are having sex with animals, would we find them to be righteous? Probably not. So since he is the creator of the world, and if God is who he says he is, and uh, you've probably heard this before, but I, I like it. I think it's the best way to say it is if if God is who he says he is, and if you are a Christian, then God actually don't kill anybody. He just changes their location. He either moves you out of his presence or keeps you in his presence. He just He's just moving you. So it's not as if, to me, it's like he can murder. He can't murder his own creation. He can change our location but he can't murder us. And so if God is who he says he is, then no, he said nobody was righteous. So I don't think him killing the entire population would be something that was bad. Okay. So from my perspective, like if we think about a doctor in the 1800s, uh, if you got shot in the leg and there's a doctor, the only way he can heal you is to cut your leg off. No other way to save you. If, if he's right. going like, to hack, hack saw your leg off. But if a doctor did that today, they would be evil because they could just give you antibiotics. They could do a much less painful method to get the same goal, right? So if right. if a god could use a less painful, evil method, but chooses not to, then he would be like the doctor t today choosing to cut your leg off instead of giving you antibiotics. That would just be evil. So to me, it seems like because God is all powerful... The fact that he chose to drown people, which is extremely painful, and they didn't consent to it, that seems very evil because he could have done something much less bad. Like he could have cured them. He could have just teleported each person to their own planet where they couldn't harm other people. He could have teleported them to heaven, poofed them out of existence, like you said. There's essentially like infinitely many things he could have done that would have been more like um, giving people a shot rather than drowning them and causing them painful deaths. So the fact that he chose to kill people when he could have just mercilessly or cured them of pain or given them their own world or like in my model, a perfect moral world is a one where it's impossible for any person to force any other person to do something they don't consent to. He could have added that in as a law of physics and that would have been the morally perfect world. And so because God, instead of like making the morally perfect world where it's impossible to force people to do things they don't consent to. He just decided to drown everybody. That seems very immoral by comparison, just like the doctor, a, t a today doctor who chose to cut your leg off when he could have just given you antibiotics. Well, I agree. Like, I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a priest, I believe it was over 500 years ago. He said something and it, it just rings true to me. Even like in the situation we're talking about now, he said, if God was to give me his power for 24 hours, you would see the differences I would make in the world. But if he gave me his wisdom too, I would leave things as they are. Because if God is all powerful and he is all wisdom, what he did and why he did it was for a purpose. Now, do I know that purpose? No, I'm not God. If I need that purpose, then I'd probably be God. 
but I don't know that purpose. And so I can't sit there and say the way he did it was wrong. And it's if God is who he says he is, and he is our heavenly father, our, our main creator, our father, then who am I to sit there and tell him the way he disciplined his children is wrong when I don't want law enforcement or other people to come to me and say, you can't discipline your kid that way. Well, it's my kid. If I want to, if I choose to spank them for, you know, not eating their food and then only grounding them for sneaking out in the middle of the night, you know, I mean, that's my choice. Those are my choices. Those are my kids. And if God is who he says he is, then, you know, it's his choice on when we live, when we die, he chooses that. And so, no, I don't see it as immoral because like I said, he said it was done was righteous and he had a purpose. Like, like if you ask me, would I have done it differently? Of course I would have done it differently. I just would have vanquished him gone, but I probably wouldn't have got the same effects as he got, you know, and I'm sure you've heard people say it, the ripple effect. I'm sure he, there was a ripple effect from him creating a flood that he got the results he needed from this happening. Now, what those are, I don't know. You know, we can see small ripple effects. If me and my wife make love and nine months later we had a baby, there's a ripple effect. You know, we knew what was going to happen nine months later, you know. And so we can see small ripple effects. But as far as long-term ripple effects, we can't. We can't see that. Only God can see that because he's all-knowing. Yeah, yeah. From I can understand so, your yes, argument. I do. That's, to me, that's atheist. And I'm just being honest. To me, the the flood itself is the biggest argument for morality and immorality when it comes to the Bible. The rest of it, I believe, is easily justified for me. But the well, flood itself? Quick quick question. No. Um, sure. the, the part where God sent uh, two bears to, to kill 40 children for making fun of a bald guy? Um, I mean, maybe maybe you maybe you think that's perfectly normal because you're bald. But... <laughs> I am bald. I wasn't always bald, though. <laughs> But I mean, I think I, I think that's typically a really good challenge, also, because God sent bears to kill forty kids for making fun of a bald. I think that's a little extreme. Making fun of a bald guy does not deserve mass bear mauling. Right, and honestly, I don't know the exact uh, scripture you're talking about. I really don't. I mean, I know a lot of the Bible. I don't know that one, but um, I mean, I'd have to do some research into it to give you an even a halfway decent answer into that because i don't know that's fair yeah what it's, i it's, do um, know second is kings a, second kings 224 you can look it up later if you want but yes yeah, perfectly perfectly reasonable answer what I, what i do know is that uh you know greg kokel yes i've met him have you yep so he comes he, he comes he's a really to, nice guy he comes to minneapolis um once a year for the rethink apologetics conference so i meet him him and all of the different stand or reason guys they come up here uh john and uh, Tim and oh, I forgot the lady's name mm, who runs their show, but yeah, I meet him. He has a, did you ever read his book? Which one tactics? Uh, no, or maybe it's not Greg Kogel. Who am I thinking of? Um, I'm trying to type it in here. I can't think today. Um, 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 What's the name of his book? Oh, Paul Copan. Yes, Paul Copan. I, I had him on my channel. Yes. We had a debate on my channel. Oh, really? Okay, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Like, uh, I like, uh, I, I think a lot of those answers, which, honestly, I, I did read the book, Is God a Moral Monster? I don't know if you did. But, uh, yeah. no, I didn't I didn't even see the one where you were where talking about with the, the bears killing the 40 children. So, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and, and go either way. Because, like I said, I've never... I don't remember reading that. I'm sure it's in there. I mean, obviously, you're not going to lie to me. I'm sure it's in there. But there was God that time never... that God said you should give all of your money to teach him. Mm -hmm. Second Kings two five hundred. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The Old Testament. I will say this: the Old Testament is something that we don't live by anymore. That is what I do know for a fact. <laughs> is we don't live by the Old Testament, and a lot of the things in the test in the Bible is a lot of it's prescription and a lot of it's a description. You know. A lot of it's for us to way to live now, and a lot of it's just to tell us how things were. And, you know, like I hear people talking all the time, they're like, 
well, how come in the Old Testament God said, you know, they couldn't, the Israelites couldn't eat pigs, they couldn't eat this, they had to wear clothes out of certain threads, and and I told him, I was like, well, there's, you know, I can give you basic answers. I can tell you that, you know, I'm not God's, but I can tell you that, you know, for one, maybe he was just trying to keep the Israelites separated from everyone else so everybody knew that they were different, that those were God's chosen people that, you know, like, hey, why are these people just different? Why do these people don't eat this? Why do these people act this way? Oh, it's because of their God, you know? And then, of course, maybe people want to be like, well, tell us about your God. And I was like, and then at the same time, I'm like, Back then, they didn't have refrigeration and a lot of things that we have nowadays. So maybe God's like, don't eat that pig. You're going to get sick, you know. <laughs> don't eat that thing. So, I mean. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. from my perspective, it seems that a perfect moral world, like God could have created a perfect moral world if he did one thing differently, which is add one extra law of physics, which is... It's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. That would end rape, murder, uh, theft, larceny, everything that is we think of as a, as a sin would just be gone. It would just be impossible because you would you just have to add one law. Don't. It's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. That's it. And it seems like that's such an easy mundane thing to do that it is, it's hard for me to imagine there is such a perfect being who could have missed that. Like that seems like no matter what what possible reason God may have, you can make it better by doing one thing. Give everyone the option. Do you want to be a part of my world with all of the suffering and death and murder and rape? Or would you like to be a part of this other world where everything is consensual? If you just gave everyone that option, everything would be perfectly moral. Like everything would be fine. Um, and so it seems like forcing people to live in this world without their consent, with all of the death and rape, is like the doctor cutting a person's leg off to get the to get the to cure them of the bacteria when all he really had to do was give them a shot and the shot in this case is consent it's just would you like to be a part of this world or would you choose to not and so for me well, because of, oh go ahead go ahead a couple of things with that is what i like to say is this is so like you know how you were saying that you know god give people a choice do you want to live here or do you not want to live here Okay, so here's here's the way I see it is if my teen my, my son's twenty five, but let's say he's a teenager, we'll pretend. So mentally he probably is. So <laughs> burn. <laughs> so if, for instance, I said you're going on the boat this weekend with me and mom, you don't have a choice, you're coming. And he comes on the boat. And then the boat starts sinking and we're all drowning. And he says, a fishing boat pulls up and says, Hey, I'm here to save you. And he says, Nope, I'm staying on this because I didn't choose to be here. I didn't have a choice. I'm going down with the boat. To me, that's, that's the same thing as what you're saying, because God's saying, I've sent you a boat. I've sent you Jesus. There is a way out. There's a way to save yourself. And then, you know, people are like, well, I didn't choose to be here. Okay, well, you didn't have to choose to be here, but you're here. So do you want to be saved or do you not? And then as far as what you were talking about with that one little simple thing, do I think it's logically possible? Yes. Do I think it's logically achievable? No, not in a world where you're going to have a creation that has free will. Free will I mean, like you said, that one little law that says don't hurt people. Well, if your laws of morality are right, then why aren't those laws there? They are there. They do tell us not to hurt people. They do tell us not to rape. But if God was to prevent them from doing that, then he's stopping free will. And the only way we can have, you know, like true love and happiness and joy is by having free will. We got to, because, well, the only way to have love is to freely give it and to freely accept it. And so if you're not, if you're going to take, so could God create a world where there was no evil? Absolutely. But we'd all be like a bunch of robots. We'd all be a bunch of, you know, walking around and just doing exactly what we're told to do by these laws that God has given us that we can't do and can do. But God wanted a free world. He wanted a world where there was moral laws and he wanted a morality world 
And the only way to achieve that is by having a free creation because God himself wanted to be loved, but he wants to be loved freely. He doesn't want it to be forced. Oh, yeah. So, but you can have free will in this world I'm describing. Like, um, can you fly? Can you jump up and fly right now? I wish. I would well, not be here. Th does that does that stop you from having free will? Does the fact that you can't fly stop you from having free will? Well, no, but that's not a moral issue. Well, right. So the fact that free will is really the desiring part. Like, if it was physically impossible to kill somebody, like Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is a paraplegic. He can't actually stab anybody. But he still has free right. will, right? Yes. So the fact that he's physically incapable of harming anybody doesn't prevent him from having free will. So if we well, add Well, he's in... physically incapable, but I'm sure mentally he's wanted to many yeah. times. He just couldn't physically do it. Exactly. So, so if we well, added an extra law of physics that it was physically impossible to kill people or to force them to do things they don't consent to... You could still have free will. You'd still be, you could still have the desire to harm people. You'd still have the free will. You'd still have the morality. You'd still have all of the love. But the extra law of physics would just be like, you can't fly, just like you can't fly. You can't stab someone in the face. That, that would just be, it's not physically possible. You can still feel it. You can still desire. But how could you, how could you stop someone from doing that, but yet still have, the, have them have free will? I understand your analogies you're using, but to me, they don't work in this scenario because how are you going to have, say free will, but then sit there and say, it's impossible for you to stab someone. How well, would that be impossible? There's lots of ways. The only way that would be impossible is that that person was just incapable of dying. That would be one like way to do it. Uh, but, but see if you did, but if, if you did that, then God didn't want to create a world where we never went back home, which if God is true, that's heaven. So he wanted a world where we could go back home. Well, that, so he can't do two things at once. Well, that's one of the ways to do it. Another way would be give everyone a personal force field. If you have a personal force field and someone tries to stab you, it's just going to hit the force field and not going to do anything. Another way would, how be, would you be... How would you make love? How would you have turn affection? Off, turn off the force field? Like, you could, you can turn it on and off. It can be like, for people who are trying well, to stab true. me... But how many times do husbands kill wives or wives kill husbands? I mean, you wouldn't be wearing your force field when you're at home with your wife, just chilling. Uh, have you seen the new Dune movie? No. So they have force fields. The way they work is velocity. If an object of X velocity comes at you, it stops it. So if you could still make love because it's not a high velocity, and if someone tries to stab you, it wouldn't work because the force field would stop the knife because it's a high velocity weapon. You do realize that's a movie. Yes, but it is. This this is <laughs> that's uh, not a possibility. That like that would be saying like you were talking about earlier, like a married bachelor. Like, you can't create that because even you, even if even if exactly what you said existed, what would stop me from putting my hands around someone's neck that had their force field down and just strangling them? Force. So if there's too much force, it would be like velocity. Too much force or too much velocity, it would stop. But the force field would activate. And this is actually possible. There is actually things that are very similar that are already ex in existence. That we, So, we, yeah, we can do that. Force fields. Yeah, well, force fields. Around human beings. Force fields definitely exist, and conditional force fields definitely exist. And if we once we get enough technology, we can definitely put them around humans. Yes. Yeah, so this is, this is all of this is realistically possible and will exist in the next 100 years, most likely. So humans, humans themselves will be able to and will create such a world that it's impossible to force people to do things they don't consent to. Like we humans are going to do it. That's, that's, that's another part of my argument is that you can't say this is impossible because humans are going to do it. And because humans are going to do it, God must also necessarily be able to do it. I don't believe that will ever exist. Like there's no way to stop crime. It's just impossible. You're not going to be able to stop crime. You're not going to be able to stop um, murder. Like you can, you can do a lot of things to help prevent it, but you'll never be able to stop it. So, <laughs> if we did, if we were able to stop it, would that stop you from being a Christian? Because we were, that would prove that morally, no, because you're still going to have evil, because the thoughts will still exist. Okay. Okay, so let's say Just we because the physical act doesn't happen doesn't mean the thought wasn't there. Okay, so let's say we stopped all of the physical acts. You still have the thoughts. You still have the thoughts. You still have the free will. But what about theft, bank robberies? Also stopped. Car theft stopped. 
all, how all, long it all stop? Uh, same kind of See, force. Because now we're getting into like a sci-fi world. Like we're saying that, that we're going to live in a world where there's no crime. Yeah, that's going to necessarily happen in the future when we gain technology. It's not really sci-fi and it's something that's pretty easily possible in lots of different ways. But the point here is that we humans can do this. So God definitely could have done this. God is an all-powerful being. He could have made this from the beginning where you still have free will, you still have evil, you still have sin, but it's physically impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to. So it seems like because that's a possibility that we can do, we're going to do this, so God could have done it. The fact that he didn't, the fact that he made us in this world, seems very, very evil. I don't think that is a world that we will ever exist in. I don't think that will happen. What if it does? Does that mean that I'm right and that God is evil? No, because the thoughts would still be there. But I don't think that'll be a world that would ever actually exist. Why? Like, don't get me wrong. That sounds like a great world. I'd love to live there. But I don't think it'll ever exist. Because the minute you find someone that creates, let's say, in and in, in what you were just saying, let's just go off of what you were saying, but there's a force field around every single human being. There's going to be somebody out there that learns how to break into one. You know what I mean? For every time there's something good that comes out, there's something bad that follows it. Just like, you know, like, oh, we're going to come up with the internet. Well, then, of course, bad things follow it. Oh, and then we come up with credit cards. This is a good thing. People can't steal your cash. Oh, but now they can steal your PIN number. Oh, let's come out with the chip inside the credit card. That'll save us. And no, it doesn't. People breaking into that. You know, so, I mean, for every good thing that happens, something bad is going to come with it. So that's why I say I don't think it'll ever be possible. Not, but I think, like... Because I've never studied or researched what you've looked into, so I, I can't say what you're saying is true or false. But let's say it is true, and they come out with these force fields. Well, sooner or later, somebody's going to come out with a way to break into it. So it's it's going to be impossible. It'd be almost pointless to even make it. Like like honestly, like to this, we're we're to the point now where it's almost pointless for them to have these microchips inside our credit cards. Like, what was the point of that? Like, I, I I don't know if you've used them a lot, but I use them every day, 100 times a day, it feels like, especially around Christmas. I mean, I still got to put in my PIN code. People can still know my PIN code. So what was the point of this chip, you know? And they're like, oh, it's safer. How is that safer? People are already stealing it. And then they're like, oh, let's come up with a credit card that we can use Wi-Fi and touch. Oh, now we got people walking around with little things that can read your card in your pocket, you know? So for every good thing to happen, something bad's going to come with it. So um, I don't think that's why I say I don't think it'll be a world that'll actually that will actually ever happen. Well, so if I look at the pattern of human history, the rate of murder, rape, violence has been going down drastically. It's dropping. It's going way, way, way down. And it seems like it's going to continue to go down. And eventually we're going to get artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence is going to run these force fields, not humans. So there's no human that's going to be able to break an artificial intelligence force field. And if I'm right about morality, we're going to be able to hey, program. Vicky. What? Vicky. I robot Vicky. <laughs> I she robot. did. Yep. 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 Vicky. That, that was a good show. I like that. Vicky. I like that show. But yeah, so, so great show. I think that we're going to get artificial intelligence and it's going to program these things and protect us in this way. And so we will live in this world. Like, and the pattern of history seems to show that, like when you said it's pointless to invent all these new chip things, I don't think so because it seems like with each new invention, the amount of people who can take advantage of it goes down. With each new invention, there's less crime, there's less murder, there's less rape, there's less stealing. So we're getting closer and closer to this world as we speak. And once we get to the point of this really highly advanced AI, we will essentially be able to decrease it to zero. So this seems like a really reasonable world that we're going to get to pretty soon, relatively speaking. So why would you say that it was pointless? Like, don't you see that um, as we make these increases crime goes down, murder goes down, the world seems to be getting better, we're in the least, the most peaceful time in human history. Like, it seems like there's, we're making a lot of progress here. Let's see here. Trying to pull this up real quick. Close. <laughs> so according to this newsletter 
It's just saying that since the 90s, overall crime rate has declined, but murder has gone up 15% in the last 21st century. But they're saying the crime rate has gone down, but murder has gone up. And it's mainly because of talking about how all the mass shootings and yada, yada, yada. And I'm sure we can look up different articles and we'll get different things. People are going to say different, whatever they want to say. Uh, well, I'm but like, this one gives a graph. This one says like in the sixties, there was less than 10,000 people murdered in, in the, and this is just in the U S and then in 1990, we were up to over 20 something thousand. looks like probably in close to 30,000. So murders. it seems like a decrease. So, so murders have gone down by 50% since the 1990s. Right. Well, it says, it was, uh, I'm going to show uh, according to this chart that I'm looking at. Um, in the nineties, it looks like it was up in around the 30,000 mark. Yeah. And then it went in around 2015, it jumped below 15,000. Right. But now we're back up to over 20,000. So it went down, but now it's on its way back up. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, well, it seems I to me like it's just going to get more and more violent. Well, like a any pattern you have like a uh, dips, dips, and goes up and down like a zigzag line. It's not like a straight right, line. Right. So it seems to me like the pattern is that it's going down and there's, there's of course there's increases, especially with like COVID when there's, when there's um huge economic crises or whatever, there's always going to be increases, but the pattern seems to be like it's going down. Like it's dropped fi yeah, 50%. Yeah, that would be great. Murder. That'd be great if murder's going down. I know in our little town, murder seems to be going crazy here lately, but, uh, like I said, I don't think there'll ever be a world where everybody's going to be walking around in a force field. I, I just don't see that happening. We will get like Star just, Trek. Star Trek will be real. I don't see. You know, that's it, it, people get mad at me all the time. I've never seen Star Trek and I've never seen Star Wars ever. I've never seen E.T. Can you believe that? <laughs> Who hasn't seen E.T.? Uh, well, that I've one, never seen E.T. I was kind of bored with that one, but I would definitely suggest Star Trek and Star Wars for sure. I did watch the new Star Trek. The Discovery or the the one with the movies? Chris Pine? Yeah. 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 I did like those. Those were funny. I watched both of those. I liked those. Yeah. I, I agree. But the other ones, like, I love William Shatner. But the other ones, they just, they were so fake looking. It's like, I, I can't pull myself to watch it. I think that's the thing with E.T. too. It's like, it's just, I mean, it looks like a football, you know? Like yep. a painted football on, the, on a stick. And I just, I can't get into it. Yeah, those guys in the 1960s and their technology, like they, they didn't, they didn't new technology. It's so boring. Yeah, yeah, like, not compared to nowadays. Yeah. You know, it's funny though. It's like I watched a lot of movies I watched back when I was younger, and like I watch it now, and I'm like, that was so horribly fake. Like I don't understand how I even thought that was real. Yep, our standards have increased as time goes on. I tell you what's getting ridiculous is all the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> what are we on, like 37 now? I don't know, but I, I just completely stopped watching them when the one episode, and I'm not saying the other ones weren't completely ridiculous, but there's like, okay, that's maybe achievable. But when he stood on his door and hit the wall to some bridge and jumped midair and caught the girl in midair, falling out of a car and landed and they were just like ow that hurt i was like okay yeah a little little like, over the top but see now i love my marvel movies because i tell people i'm like well that's different though i'm like because i'm not expecting it to be realistic you know i'm expecting thor and the incredible hulk but if i'm watching fast and the furious these aren't superheroes these are supposed to be realistic things that can happen which they don't yeah, I totally understand. But yeah, it's uh, we've been going on for several hours now. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Really enjoyed our conversation. Would you like to give everyone uh, where they can find you on social media and YouTube and stuff again and give any like concluding remarks or whatever? Yeah, so you basically can find me on, uh, I'm on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube, and we're on pretty much any kind of podcasting network out there. It's all under the same name, The Christian Apologist uh and uh, basically, we're just out to try to find truth. We're not out to demean. Uh, we're not out to make people feel a certain way. I'm not attacking atheists. Like, I like to learn from atheists. I learned a lot from you today. 
Um, learn some things I need to study up on that I've never even heard of. So this is going to be interesting for me for the next week or two. And um, it's just about pursuing truth and, and whatever that truth is. And that's basically all we're about is just trying to get people to follow the truth and uh, not listen to the scientists, but actually follow the scientist evidence and follow the evidence yourself and see where it leads. And I got a book coming out. Hopefully it'll be out in about three or four months. It's called Stand for God. And hopefully I can meet up with you sometime and do some of your conferences. Absolutely.